participants. Uh, and uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Yuri Vasilevsky, who will give a, a lecture on personal, uh, personalized computational CD hemodynamics and clinical applications. Uh, since he is the, the, uh, uh, one of the main speakers, I will uh, give some, uh, tell you some words about uh, what I know about Professor Yuri. Uh, I know him uh, since several years. Uh, so he is, uh, he is a numerical analyst. He works on uh, uh, theory of quasi-optimal meshes, mesh generation and the adaptive uh, adaptation and uh, iterative methods, uh, discretization methods for PDEs, computation of fluid dynamics, computational hemodynamics, and reservoir simulations. Uh, so this, this will be about hemodynamics. I think it's one of his present interests. Uh, so applications of numerical methods to hemodynamics. And uh, Professor Yuri Vasilevsky is a member, a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, is professor at, uh, at the Institute of Numerical uh, and, uh, uh, Numerical Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, Russian Deputy of Director of for Science and Professor at several universities, uh, Stekhanov University, Moscow State University, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. I don't know if I said everything about you, Yuri, but <laughs> I said that I could. Uh, and uh, so uh, thank you for, for coming to the conference. You are at home, I'm not. <laughs> And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be your uh, shared person. And you have 40 minutes uh, for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Adele. And you are so kind to, to say these words. Okay, thank you very much um, for the invitation. I'm going to talk about uh, personalized uh, hemodynamics and clinical applications. So uh, I walk... Uh, in addition to my uh, basic institute, Marchuk Institute of Numerical uh, Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Science, I also work at Sechenov University, which is the largest medical university in Russia. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, university provides uh, to us different tasks related to clinical applications. This work was uh, supported by the Russian Science Foundation, by the way. So the co-authors of my work are Maxim Alshansky from uh, the University of Houston, Alexander Danilov from the Institute of Numerical Mathematics, Alexander Lazovsky from the same institute, and Tatiana Dobrosyergova from the same institute. Uh, the outline of my talk uh, is uh, as follows. At the first uh, step, I will present Navier-Stokes equation, equations in uh, time-dependent domains. And uh, after that, I present applications, two applications to 3D flow in human uh, ventricles. Ventricles. Uh, after that, I will uh, pass to the two-scale hemodynamic model and its application to fontan surgery. Uh, so some prerequisites of uh, my equations, future equations. So we consider a reference domain omega, which is in, immovable uh, and uh, denote uh, by xi, the transformation, which uh, maps uh, the reference domain omega to physical domain, domain omega t. Uh, in uh, reference domain omega, we define uh, velocity and displacement uh, vector fields V and U. And if we know uh, displacements of each point of omega, uh, we can define uh, explicitly the transformation xi. This is just uh, uh, addition to any coordinate, coordinate x as the displacement U. Uh, given uh, the, this transformation, we can define the gradient of deformation F and uh, its determinant J or Jacobian of the transformation. 
Uh, the Cauchy stress tensor is denoted by sigma, uh, pressure is P, and density is rho. We assume that the density of, uh, of uh, the fluid is constant. Uh, uh, we assume that uh, for the first two applications that uh, the domain is, uh, is, uh, can uh, evolve and uh, the transformation Xi is given, is known. Uh, how it can be known, uh, I will explain later. Then we can write uh, the momentum equation, the Naviast of the momentum equation of the Navier-Stokes equation in the reference domain in ILE arbitrary Lagrangian uh, earlier uh, formulation uh, as follows. Uh, factors F and J comes in, uh, into terms of these equations because of uh, uh, the reference domain. It is, uh, it is written in the reference domain. Uh, the, uh, the Lagrangian Eulerian formulation comes uh, from the fact that acceleration, the left hand side of the equation, is not multiplied by these factors. Uh, also, we write a fluid incompressibility in the reference domain. Uh, it also uh, has these factors, these equations. Uh, this equation has factors j and f minus one. And we write uh, the Newtonian constitutive relation for the fluid stress tensor, which relates uh, stress tensor uh, to pressure and a velocity. And again, factor F comes here because it is written, the, the relation is written in the reference domain. Uh, the numerical technique uh, for the solving these equations is based on um, consistent tetrahedral mesh uh, uh, in uh, the reference domain. Uh, we shall use uh, LBB stable pairs, uh, pair of velocity and pressures uh, and pressure. Uh, the velocity uh, finite element space are continuous piecewise quadratic functions and the pressure uh, finite element space is continuous piecewise linear functions. We discretize these equations using open source software, ANI3D, which provides uh, mesh generation tools, finite element system, uh, of different types and algebraic solvers. Uh, the finite element scheme uh, is obtained from the weak formulation of uh, our dynamic equations. Uh, we multiply the dynamic equation by a test function, uh, psi or q, and uh, then replace uh, the Hilbert, uh, Hilbert spaces by their finite element subspaces and comes to and uh, replace uh, the time derivatives by implicit or uh, by backward Euler discretizations. And we come to these two uh, uh, discrete equations, uh, which uh, uh, which contain only linear terms. The nonlinear term uh, uh, is linearized uh, because uh, we take uh, um, we take uh, the factor uh, in the in the braces here uh, from the extrapolation from the previous time steps, and thus uh, this system of equation is linear equations is linear system. We add the uh, boundary, uh, boundary conditions, uh, which uh, he, in this application corresponds to no slip boundary conditions, uh, which means that the velocity, uh, the velocity is equal to the velocity at, at the boundary of, uh, of, of uh, non-penetrable boundary uh, is equal to the velocity of the boundary of the wall and of the, of the domain and on a penetrable boundary, we assume do nothing condition, which means free inflow or outflow. And this is the finite element scheme. Uh, this scheme is semi-implicit. Uh, it produces one linear system per time step. It is first order in time 
and maybe generalized to the second order in time. It is proven to be unconditionally stable in the sense that uh, the stability estimate uh, uh, does not uh, assume uh, any CFL type restriction on a uh, time step. And it is proven to be second order accurate, proved uh, under the following assumptions. Uh, first, we, assume, we, we sh should assume that uh, the, the, uh, the gradient of uh, deformation uh, tensor is not um, uh, very large. Uh, the, the, the domain does not change extremely uh, severely. Second, we assume that uh, the finite element pairs, pair is LBB stable, uh, which is true for Taylor Hood uh, pair. And uh, we also assume that time step is not very large, but it is not restricted by the uh, spatial mesh size. Uh, to illustrate uh, the theory, I just uh, present here. Uh, extraction from the theorem, uh, which shows the convergence of the finite element solution. We, uh, of course, we assume um, uh, some uh, smoothness uh, for, uh, for displacement uh, of, 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 the, of the domain, of, 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 for the displacements of the domain. And uh, we can prove uh, that uh, the error, uh, L2 error and uh, energy norm error, uh, they are bounded by this, this uh, right hand side, which in case of uh, Taylor Hood uh, finite element, uh, finite elements, which I already introduced piecewise quadratic velocities and piecewise linear pressure, provides the second order of accuracy in space. Uh, with respect to mesh size and first order accuracy in, in time. Uh, now, uh, important, uh, important uh, remark about uh, uh, stabilization of convective, convective in instabilities at high Reynolds numbers. Uh, in many uh, cardiovascular applications, uh, blood flow has high Reynolds number of, of order of 1000. And uh, stabiliza convective stabilization is um, an issue. We uh, consider three uh, types of convective stabilization. The first type is very simple. It, it is a stabilization by adding Smogarinsky turbulent viscosity. Basically, we modify the viscosity, blood viscosity by addition, uh, by an extra term, which of course uh, mesh dependent, otherwise we would not have uh, convergence, mesh convergence. And um, uh, the, at, each tetrahed at each tetrahedral cell, um, and uh, this, uh, this uh, viscosity, uh, extra viscosity, depends on the rate of deformation tensor, uh, which is taken from the previous time step, at the previous time step. So we add extra viscosity. The second, uh, the second uh, possibility is uh, streamline uh, affin petrov galerkin method, which was introduced almost 40 years ago. And several years ago, it was uh, generalized to, to moving meshes. And the third option is to combine uh, streamline of petrov galerkin uh, stabilization and uh, uh, partial weighted Smogarinsky uh, 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 turbulent viscosity stabilization. The weight epsilon is small, like 1% of the normal uh, Smogarinsky turbulent uh, viscosity. Uh, to illustrate uh, the impact of uh, 
stabilization, for instance, CPG stabilization on the accuracy, we consider an analytical solution with a reference domain, which is a tube with a non-constant uh, diameter. And uh, this tube uh, is, uh, is, is shrinking uh, in time. And we can write explicitly uh, the solution to the Navier-Stokes equation with non-zero right-hand side. And we test this uh, solution, uh, the accuracy of the finite element approximation on a sequence of quasi-uniform tetrahedral meshes with uh, uh, mesh sizes, which are um, divided by square root of two. So we have uh, in each column of this table, we have uh, finer and finer quasi-uniform mesh. The time step of the finite element scheme should also be refined. And we uh, just present here the L2 norm of the finite element solution and the energy norm of the finite element solution for the velocity. Uh, and we see clearly that uh, L2 norm shows the third uh, uh, order of accuracy and the energy norm shows the second order of accuracy both for non-stabilized and stabilized SUPG by SUPG stabilized solution. Uh, the density and uh, viscosity in this case are chosen to, uh, to, to, to fit, uh, to fit um, uh, the blood properties. But the velocity uh, in this analytical solution is uh, smaller than uh, the flow observed, the velocity observed in, in the heart chambers. Um, the second observation is uh, if we reduce the viscosity further uh, and uh, want to demonstrate how the stabilization works, um, on, uh, on at high Reynolds numbers, uh, we uh, reduce viscosity and show that uh, SUPG stabilization produce better, uh, better accuracy compared to combination of CPG and Smogarinsky stabilization, but at, at, at moderate viscosities, but ex at extremely small viscosities, uh, Smogarinsky stabilization produces a smaller error, uh, both in L2 and energy norms, because uh, CPG stabilization at a very high Reynolds number still produces a, a slightly oscillatory solution. Uh, now I switch to uh, the workflow for personalized simulations. The general, uh, the general uh, workflow is as follows. On the input we have a sequence of uh, contrast enhanced uh, computer, uh, tomo computer tomography images of one cardiac cycle from a real patient. Uh, uh, it depends on application. You, we may have 10 images or we may have 100 images uh, per cardiac cycle. Then each uh, image uh, should be denoised uh, and uh, we suggest uh, to segment uh, in semi-automatic or semi-manual uh, way a few images of this set, like, like three images, uh, the beginning of systole, uh, end of systole, and uh, uh, the fastest uh, uh, phase of diastole. And uh, then uh, uh, we apply uh, supervised machine learning techniques for segmentation of all images. In particular, we apply a random forest classifier. And then uh, we end up with segmentation of all set, uh, of entire set of, uh, of uh, CT images. Then uh, we can apply a meshing of one of segmented image, uh, for instance, of the first first image in the sequence and uh, produce a, a sequence of topologically invariant tetrahedral meshes uh, uh, which approximate uh, the boundary of the domain at each 
of, of in this sequence of, of, of the domains in, in this sequence. If uh, the sequence is not um, uh, large enough, we can refine this uh, sequence of uh, topologically invariant tetrahedral mesh by splitting, uh, 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 by interpolating uh, positions of nodes between them uh, and uh, introducing more uh, meshes within the cardio cycle. Uh, and these meshes actually, they define uh, the transformation Xi K, which enters to, uh, to the Navier-Stokes equations and to the finite element scheme because uh, the positions of uh, nodes of these uh, tetrahedral meshes, uh, they explicitly define um, the difference of, of these positions between the, key, the case mesh and the first mesh uh, explicitly defines this transformation Xi. Then we can solve now your Stokes equations with the finite element scheme and post process and visualize solution. So this is a general workflow. So example one, uh, we address blood flow in left ventricle of a patient. This is anonymized, anonymized uh, female, 50 years old. The resolution is about uh, half millimeter, the size of one voxel from a uh, CT image. We have 100 uh, images for one cardiac cycle. Uh, which lasts approximately 1.27 seconds. This is, uh, these are compute, uh, contrast enhanced uh, computer tomography. And um, three of these hundred images were segmented uh, manually by Alexander Danilov using, uh, using ITK SNAP software. And uh, we, uh, he uh, segmented uh, left ventricle, which is shown here in red. And with these three images, uh, he applied uh, supervised machine learning by random for forest classifier and produces all other, uh, produced all uh, other 97 segmentations. Of course, uh, the machine learning technique produces uh, many holes and uh, wrong um, uh, wrong um, uh, anatomical features, but they may be cleaned by dilation and erosion uh, erosion operations with uh, segmented images. Thus, we have uh, 100 segmented images and, uh, and one can generate a set of topologically invariant tetrahedral meshes. Uh, one of these mesh is shown here in different cut by different cutoff planes. This mesh contains approximately 70,000 tetrahedral cells. Now, uh, the problem of uh, simulation of the flow in left ventricle is that the volume of the ventricle changes very quickly uh, within cardiac cycle. For instance, the right plot here shows that within like 100, uh, approximately 100 uh, milliseconds, uh, the volume changes uh, by 70%. This is a lot. And the flow velocity are quite high. Uh, so in simulation, we impose um, uh, simple boundary conditions on the on the boundary on the ventricle uh, denoted by number one, we impose uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. On, uh, on the valves, uh, we assume uh, that they are e e either freely open uh, during systole or diastole or completely closed. And this simple simulation, uh, this simple assumption allows us to impose either do nothing boundary condition or Dirichlet boundary condition on each valve, mitral and aort. Uh, next, uh, since the velocity, the, the volume changes very quickly, even uh, 100 uh, time steps per cycle uh, is not, per cardiac cycle is not enough. And we have to refine time step by factor 20, not because of 
uh, uh, instability issues but because uh, of just accuracy issues uh, we have to refine uh, the time step um, this is done by uh, refining the sequence of meshes uh, by a cubic spline interpolation in time and uh, the properties of velocity or the properties of the blood, uh, which uh, the density and viscosity implies that it is not possible to solve uh, the Navier-Stokes equation without uh, convective stabilization. In this application, we use uh, combined cpg smogarinsky stabilization and Smogarinsky stabilization, both options are applicable. Now I switch to the movie and show this uh, movie and give some commands. Okay. Okay. Let me to to start it. Is it seen? Yes, we see it. We can see. Yeah. Yes. So this is a sequence of segmented uh, images for the left ventricle, which is red. Um, then you will see the sequence of the meshes, which are topologically invariant for the left ventricle. They are in gray. Uh, and uh, this uh, beating mesh actually defines uh, the deformation, uh, the, the, the transformation map Xi, which enters to the Navier-Stokes equations, and we solve Navier-Stokes equation on this sequence of meshes. Uh, we can solve, we, we find everything. Uh, velocity, pressure, we can write, uh, apply post-processing, write Q criterion and so on. So this is, this is that. So this is just illustration of, of, of this simulation. Next, I switch to proceed to my talk. Is it seen? Yes, yes. Okay. The example two. Uh, this uh, data are, are, are provided to us by our colleagues from Houston Methodist Hospital. Um, and uh, this patient uh, has a transposition of the great arteries. It means that the role of the left ventricle is played by the right ventricle. Uh, in this case, we have much less images, uh, computer, to uh, computer tomography images, uh, but pretty nice resolution uh, in space. And uh, we had to increase the number of uh, uh, segmented images of in time. This was done by switching to, uh, by, by Alexander Danilov uh, as follows. Uh, so each uh, image uh, is segmented and uh, uh, using a, a semi-automated level set method. This level set function defines the, the, the right ventricle. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, 10 snapshots of this level set function. Uh, this level sense set function is interpolated between, in time, between uh, this uh, time, uh, uh, this uh, snapshot, and uh, we can uh, uh, and define other segment segmentations in uh, intermediate times. Thus, we can produce, for instance, 100 or uh, more uh, 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 segmented images and uh, 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 tetrahedral meshes. Example is shown here. Uh, and then apply the same technique and compute uh, streamlines, uh, Q criterion, wall shear stresses on different uh, uh, parts of cardiac cycles. At the end of my talk, uh, the details of these simulations and uh, scheme is presented in our book. 
um, uh, but I want to uh, give you within the last five minutes uh, you um, new problem which we are trying to solve uh, which uh, which is related to uh, the flow in a so-called total cover pulmonary connection uh, this uh, problem was uh, said to us by uh, Andrei Svobodov and Lyudmila, Lyudmila Yurpolskaya from Vakulev Cardiovascular Center, National Cardiovascular Center. They have these operations. So uh, there are patients with uh, congenital single ventricle. The right ventricle uh, um, works improperly because of some pathological defects. And uh, palliation of this uh, uh, state uh, is provided by uh, several interventions, uh, which uh, well, this is multi-stage procedure within uh, 10 years. Uh, these interventions, they divert uh, blood flow from interior vena cava from here and superior vena cava uh, to uh, right uh, pulmonary artic uh, uh, artery and left pulmonary artery directly. Uh, skipping the right ventricle. So right ventricle is eliminated from, from the circulation, from the pulmonary circulation. And um, uh, such uh, circulation with single left ventricle and cover pulmonary anastomosis, which connects uh, the inferior uh, vena cava with, uh, with, uh, uh, with um, uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, this is an uh, artificial tube here. Uh, it's called Fontaine, Fontaine circulation. And because uh, a, a surgeon uh, uh, Fontaine uh, introduced it in 1967, 50 years ago. And uh, the problem of, uh, of this uh, uh, circulation is to choose, to, to choose optimal configuration of this uh, total cover pulmonary connection. Uh, the, the region which is shown here in gray and, um, and violet. Uh, and also what is interesting uh, in, from this mathematical point of view, how the flow dis, uh, redistributed under physical exercises of a patient. Uh, so we have, um, we suggested a two scale model for the fountain circulation, uh, which uh, uh, addresses uh, 3D Navier-Stokes equations uh, in a rigid wall, uh, in domain in rigid wall in uh, this uh, total uh, cover pulmonary connection region, which is shown here in gray, and uh, one the hemodynamic equation equations uh, in uh, the uh, systemic arteries and systemic veins. Uh, the one the hemodynamic equations uh, are obtained from the um, navier stokes equations by cross area averaging, assuming that the tubes are collapsible. So these are the equations, momentum, balance, and mass, uh, uh, mass balance equations in each vessel of the arterial and uh, uh, venous uh, tree. Uh, VK here is averaged uh, linear velocity, averaged in the over cross section. SK is the cross section area, and PK is the blood pressure. Actually, there are a bunch of uh, different models uh, which varies in different uh, details, uh, I, I refer here just to a review paper, which discussed several papers, uh, several methods or models. Um, also, we have to impose um, a positive pressure drop condition at, uh, the, at the bifurcation uh, nodes, and uh, we have to take into account elasticity of the vessel wall. Uh, by the so-called tube equations, uh, tube equation, which connects uh, 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 transmural pressure to the cross-sectional area with uh, velocity, pulse wave velocity coefficient and function f, uh, known analytical dependence of uh, SK. 
this uh, model can account uh, uh, gravity, venous valve, autoregulation in standing positions for a patient in standing position. For patient in la uh, laying position, horizontal position, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, gravity valves and autoregulation should not be maybe ignored. Um, so the three Dinavia Stokes equations in the, with rigid wall are just uh, written clearly here. Uh, the normal component of, um, of the stress is balanced by uh, pressure uh, uh, at the boundary on inlet and outlet of this total cover pulmonary connection. And uh, uh, the 3D uh, model is um, uh, coupled to the 1D model at the inlet of TCPC uh, via continuity of the normal stress and continuity of the flux. And at the outlet, uh, which are uh, pulmonary arteries of TCPC, uh, we impose uh, the positive pressure drop condition, which relates uh, uh, pressure to microvas at microvascular bed of pulmonary microvascular bed and the flux. Uh, the problem uh, is um, uh, with data is that they are very erroneous. We may have, uh, for instance, so-called uh, 4D MRI flow uh, data, which uh, are assumed to be correct with respect to flow um, and uh, cross sections. But uh, uh, very, uh, very simple uh, um, analysis shows that uh, this, oh, I have to finish that these data are uh, very noisy and you can, we cannot um, rely to cross sections due to MRI flow data, 4D flow data and uh, fluxes uh, because of large error. Uh, that's why uh, we have to minimize data due to 4D flow MRI and use only time averaged flow rates, which allow us to tune hydraulic resistance of the model, resistances of the model, and, um, and that's it. Uh, the computer tomography produce for us, of course, uh, the domain, the 3D domain, and, uh, uh, and the mesh. Unfortunately, I have no time to discuss uh, the workflow, how we personalize this two-scale model. Tatiana Dobrosserdova made it uh, recently. And we produced uh, the 3D flows uh, and 3D, pre 3D pressure fields uh, in this connection. And we can compare the redistribution of blood flow for the patient, particular patient in horizontal and standing position. And we can show that uh, the hemodynamics in standing positions deteriorates and it is hampered uh, because um, the distribution uh, uh, between left and right uh, lung is uh, more unbalanced. Uh, the flow, the energy efficiency in this uh, cow pulmonary connection reduces from 95 to 84%. And the hepatic flow is small, which is in standing position, which is much worse. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for, for late. No, no, it's it's fine. Thank you very much, Yuri, for your very very nice uh, talk. And so I I open for uh, questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. So Bertoglio. Uh, I think. Really? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Yuri, for your nice talk. I have a question about data. Mm -hmm. um, you show this CT cardiac CT image with hundred uh, cardiac faces. Yes. Uh, that sounds to me like quite impressive. I never heard that. Uh, yes. Well, that may, see, if yes. it's possible, then the radiation dose, uh, well, sounds to me that it could be very, very high because it's already hard to get the the ten faces. Uh, you, 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 you are right, and this is. Uh exactly what uh, people from Houston gave to us. They gave to us uh, 10, uh, 10 frames per cycle, 
but uh, uh, in Moscow in Sechen of University they have super uh, super uh, super nice <laughs> city uh, Toshiba uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken and uh, it may happen that uh, they um, uh, have uh, intrinsic software which produce a hundred uh, 100 frames per cycle based on maybe 20, I don't know how many uh, physical uh, snapshots. So uh, it is completely hidden inside. The, uh, the clinicians, they just press the button and they got this 100 uh, frames. When we asked them, please show us how many physical uh, uh, frames was produced. They replied to us, they, they don't know. It is just completely hidden in the so equipment. You're, yeah, you're, because if you maybe go back to that image, it, uh, you pass it quickly. When you show it, it, it looked to me that uh, it's a bit blurred. What they, uh, unusually blurred for being a CT image. You see, or maybe that's a, maybe an, uh, a visualization yes, yes, thing. Yes, yes. Yes, Usually yes, CT yes. images are, are are sharper. Maybe if, yeah. if you have one for the other patient, yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. quite blurred. Yeah. Uh, we have to ask Alexander Danilov. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly how to comment uh, 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 this fact. I just know that uh, we were really surprised uh, with this hundred images per cycle, and wanted to understand how it 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 could, produ could be produced. And the answer was that it is hidden inside. I mean, in the equipment, I'm sure that uh, it is not uh, really 100 uh, frames. Otherwise, uh, the load would be terrific. And if I have time, if there are no other questions, I oh, know I see that there are other questions, so I will, I will pass with mine. Thanks. OK, so uh, who wants to ask questions? I don't see the, the name. Well, if you if you press on the participant, you will have the list of participants, and you will see people who raise hands. Okay. And, uh, and eventually, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Yuri, thank you very much for this uh, brilliant presentation. And I would like to ask a short question. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, so for these left ventricle simulations and turbulence, all the things. Uh, Non-Newtonian properties of blood, is it important or not? We did not compare explicitly. Uh, so I don't know, I, I don't know. Uh, in principle, it is possible to, 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 to introduce a non-Newtonian uh, rheology, uh, but I don't know, does it make sense or not? Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Adelia, with other I, questions. I uh, I don't see other ends, but I have a question as well concerning the left ventricle. Uh, Yuri, you 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 talked about uh, um, I Reynolds number, and I saw um, in the case of the left ventricle, I saw very low um, uh, uh, viscosity value uh, so is this physiological uh, yes is, yes it is just it is just a physiological viscosity it, it it's is, not a, a pathological case it's physiological. no no no, no. yes okay yes. because uh, so i know that uh, that for instance in in case of anemia or so the reynolds number increases because the viscosity is uh, is uh, is very low uh, in general but in the left ventricle i didn't know that the 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 viscosity was so low in that case no no we just took uh, the, this value from uh, from 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 your book from your paper <laughs> yeah i i have this value there <laughs> I remember and so and in, in that case you need the stabilization yes yes in order to to yes. to get uh, good uh, good results okay thank you so i don't see more hands are there any other no so okay yeah. no in I fact mean, in fact uh krista Bali has another question yeah because i thought there were more people yeah i have another okay yeah. one short question 
Mm -hmm. uh, you have, um, so I understand that you apply the displacement field from your image processing. Right. In the, in the left ventricle. So this is in, uh, well, in some sense, Eulerian information. So while, yes. while for, your, for your boundary data, you need actually the, the actual Lagrangian displacement. So uh, how sure are you uh, that that, say, image processing procedure gives you reason, uh, displacements at the boundary that are kind of close to the Lagrangian displacement, to the physiological Lagrangian displacement? And if uh, maybe you have, very, you have validated doing, for example, if you do a, a, with us in a synthetic data, you can take a cardiac mechanics simulation and apply that and then apply your image procedure over that and then compare both, something like that. This is absolutely right way to, uh, to, very, to validate the approach, what you suggested. We did not do this, but we have to do this. Actually, the main problem is that uh, CT data do not provide uh, us uh, twisting we don't see twisting of left ventricle, of the left ventricle, because it is not seen uh, on the CT. And that's why uh, the twisting component of the Lagrangian, of the Lagrangian velocity of the boundary is completely ignored in our case. And this is not correct, but uh, we cannot extract it from CT data. I heard about uh, from one Japanese uh, that they want to they want to write uh, a software and uh, uh, to make it proprietary software of uh, a CT scanner, which provides you uh, the twisting, the twisting from CT. But, uh, but I have not heard about the result. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could, instead of doing FSI as a first order, you could, I'm sorry if there is some background noise, but I'm in the hospital. I have an appointment with clinicians later. So, uh, the, if you track, you can track some structures in the CT images, like uh, for example, some papillary muscles or Absolutely. this type of thing, That's right. and maybe add that motion a bit. Yes, to we try your... to do this, but uh -huh. uh, it is uh, there are very very few un answers which you could track. Okay, that's the problem. So okay. uh, the, the problem is that you actually what we could do, we could, for instance. Um, uh, try to use uh, uh, ultrasound images and ultrasound data to, 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 to uh, impose uh, twisting because they uh, provide some data by sectors, by sectors about twisting. But uh, this will be very artificial and we yeah. decided not to do this. Actually. But if you don't see the twisting in the CT, you're not going to see it in the, in the ultrasound either, uh, because it's... No, 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 ultrasound, they can no, do Excuse it. me, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt the discussion. Sorry, but we are late for the... Yes, yes. Okay, sure. yeah, yeah, we need to go on <laughs> to proceed. Yeah, with the next... Thank you very much, uh, yes, Yuri sure. and all the, the other uh, participants for the discussion as well. Mm -hmm. So we, we pass to the next speaker. Um, so, uh, Igor Chernyavsky, uh, yeah, Chernyavsky, 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 yeah, that's right, thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's, it's the name, okay, I'm, I'm not pronouncing very well, okay, okay, so the title is there. Can you, can okay. you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, we can see it. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so so our net, uh, next speaker, we have now, we pass to the smaller sessions, uh, so the session of cardiovascular system, so 30 minutes each. Uh, and the next speaker from uh, the Department of Mathematics and Maternal and Fetal uh, Health Research Center of uh, Manchester University. Uh, and the talk is Structural Determinants of Function in Complex Microstructural Tissues. Uh, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for introduction. Thank you for inviting me to present. Um, so I would like to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the transport or rather exchange in complex tissues. And a majority of the talks will be a microvascular tissues. So we're moving from the large scale vasculature to small scale vasculature. 
And that's all about the talk between the mother and uh, her baby. I would like to start by acknowledging the many collaborators who contributed to this work. So the theory part uh, was done by uh, researchers I work with, Alexander Elish and Philip Pierce. Uh, Philip is now in UCL and Alex at Grenoble. And uh, we in turn uh, did lots of complex uh, image analysis uh, on the synchrotron microcity data. And of course, we are supported by a variety of research councils in the UK. So the Human Placenta fascinated people for quite some time, starting from the works of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who actually did a very accurate anatomic representation of the womb. And then in the medieval times, there were slightly naive uh, interpretation of the development of the human uh, as a humunculus, a uh, minuscule human. But more recently, there is an amazing progress in technology. For example, you can see a reasonably recent work about so-called artificial placenta or biobag, where there is now potential to maintain extremely premature fetuses, in this case, lung fetuses, outside the womb, still perfused through the placenta. And they give birth to, well, they deliver it from this biobag as a healthy, fully mature uh, fetuses. And very recently, uh, literally uh, over less than half a year ago, uh, there is work which shows the progress from the other direction, where the mice embryos are taken less than one week from the development and put in the incubator uh, and shown to grow for at least a week, uh, reasonably healthily. So you can see that this gap is closing between the uh, uh, ex vivo um, development. The missing link here is the placenta, because the reason why they cannot produce viable fetuses is because they only can grow it by passive diffusion of nutrients and oxygen. And you can see the background, the placenta and the umbilical cord. Hopefully you'll see my cursor. So the placenta is not uh, really addressed here. So that's a bit of a science fiction, of course, but the placenta itself has a multiple critically important clinical implications because that's the the critical life support system which acts as all multifunctional support for the fetus as a lung as the stomach and as many other regulatory systems and it's absolutely unique among mammals so placenta of a human is very different from placenta of the mouse and so there are really no direct analogs, except for perhaps very high primates, which are not really accessible for cost and also for ethical reasons. And I would like to start by showing you a quick movie of the recent imaging we obtained uh, in Synchrotron. So you can see here, and hopefully you'll appreciate the many scales of the human placenta. So you can see the cube of about eight millimeter cubed in size. And it consists of maternal and fetal domains with the very dense and complex vasculature. And as we zoom in, in this block, you will see different compartments. So now in a moment, you'll see the porous side of the human placenta, which is the maternal domain. And then it has a secondary uh, structure, which is the vasculature of the fetus the fetoplacental domain, which provides the link between the maternal and fetal circulations. So here you can appreciate the complex structure of the fetal placental vasculature. And we extracted this also using the combination of semi-automatic and uh, machine learning techniques. And then finally, you see the element of exchange I would like to pause here for a moment. And that will be one of the main subject of the talk, where you can appreciate the complex arrangement of the interface between the mother and her baby. This is the vessels and the outside is the tissue and it's surrounded by the maternal blood directly. But of course, the two circulations never mix. So that is just an intricate multi-structural, multi-domain system. And that's just a summary. So you can go all the way from the umbilical cord down to the capillaries, and in between they're linked through the porous-like medium interface. 
And I would like to tell you two stories today. One briefly is about the maternal side, the porous side, slightly larger scale, and then focusing on the exchange unit, which consists of the fetal capillaries and the corresponding um, tissues and maternal environment. Okay, so that's two key domains here. So first, if we zoom in even further, we'll see that, of course, this interface is intricate and it has lots of biochemical and um, classical features of a membrane. But today I'm only going to focus on the simplest possible diffusive transport, which doesn't require energy uh, contribution to the transport. But even though these questions are difficult enough to address. So very briefly, the topic of modeling of placenta is not absolutely new. There was interest for quite some time, for over 50 years, but often it was treated as a black box and only reasonably recently, within might be about less than 10 years ago, there was an interest of looking at the special component, like the porous medium flow. And extremely recently, literally last five years, also there's an explosion of image-based data, similar to uh, Professor Wasilewski's talk. We have much more images coming into action. And we uh, and our groups, of course, are interested in utilizing these images. But then they have a question of how we can reduce the complexity associated with the multiple components and low numbers of representative structures which we can analyze in a given model. So the question is, can we assimilate that new information into more upscaled level? So can we revisit this black box, but with a better understanding of underlying macrostructure and corresponding macrophysics? So first, briefly about the porous side of the human placenta, the maternal side. So as I said, we looked at a reasonably large block of tissue in the synchrotron in the national uh, facility uh, in the UK. And we can apply classical approaches to extract the different, decompose the domain into the maternal at the bottom and the fetal at the top and run, for example, the porous medium flow and uh, estimate the resi hydraulic resistance and other parameters, um, treating it as a classical porous medium and study the statistics of the network. But the always question remain is how much we trust these results and how the errors depend on the scale. So if we'll take a smaller or larger block, can we predict the accuracy of any extracted quantities? Because the model is only as good as it's accurate. So with, it, with this question in mind, I would like to briefly talk about some approaches we developed for quantifying the uncertainty in extracting the quantities for modeling purposes and identifying the appropriate scales for these uncertainties. So if we look at the cross sections of this tissue, we can see that, for example, area fraction is the simplest measure, oscillates wildly. And as we increase the size, this error will diminish naturally, but the question is, can we quantify it a bit more? And indeed, if we think of correlations and outer correlations, so, so second order moments of uh, special statistical quantities, we can expect that for very large sizes, the, this domain will be, uh, will be close to uniformly random isotropic, but for very small sizes, there will be a lot of correlations and possibly a lot of contribution to this noise. So we can identify so-called mesoscale, where these correlations diminish sufficiently. And indeed, if we look at the relative error for both the area fraction and volume fraction, so the, sorry, not the area fraction, but the specific surface area, which is of interest, of course, for the any reactive or transport features, they all diminish as we increase the size of our volume of interest. And more interestingly, once we go to the scale larger than the mesoscale, we can actually get a theoretical estimate of how our error is going to drop. And it turns out that it diminishes as inversely proportional to the square root of the volume. So if we want to improve the error estimate of the volume fraction or the specific surface area by a factor of two, we need to increase the volume by a factor of four. And this will become even more significant as we go to smaller volumes. So with it in mind, so having some idea of what is representative scale and how to control the error, 
I would like to switch to the other uh, story, is the fetal placental circulation. And here you can see, hopefully, in a moment, sorry. So we have, in this case, confocal microscopy, which is similar to a micro CT. And it gives us re enough resolution to reconstruct this unit, so the, the microvasculature and surrounding tissue, providing us an envelope. So th that is the fetal side, and outside is maternal side. So the question is, can we quantify and get an effective model to predict the exchange of the solute across this interface? So we can solve, in this case, because the flow is relatively slow, so we can solve Stokes flow in the network, but the geometry, of course, is quite complex. And we can solve the advection diffusion in the network. And I want to note here that we have the facilitation of uptake because some solutes, such as oxygen or CO2 or carbon monoxide, they strongly bind to red blood cells, and therefore there is an adjective boost to these solutes, but not to all of them. So there is a potential factor which we should take into account. And other side is, of course, we need to get to the network. So we need to identify how to deliver the solute across the interface. And it's useful to think of diffusive capacity in this regard. So literally solving the diffusion, but in a very complex uh, non-trivial interface uh, in, a, in, a, in a very non-trivial domain. And what we are really interested in is the possible maximum flux we can deliver which is just a function of the geometry times the biochemical features of the solute, such as diffusivity and the applied gradient across the interface between the blue maternal and the red fetal. So I would like you to keep in mind this curly L. So that's effectively for any given solute and any given applied gradient. It's just the direct function of geometry alone. So it's only preserved geometric information of the interface. And the good news is that we only need three parameters to quite accurately capture features of the exchange of the transport across the placental um, exchange unit. So first is the resistance of the network, which is again is just a geometric feature for the Stokes flow. The second is the one I mentioned, is this characteristic length scale, which captures the diffusive capacity for very simple, say spherical, interface, it will be the surface area over diffusive distance, which separates the two uh, domains, two circulations. But also we need a reference length scale, say the total length of all the uh, central lines of the network, seen as a, as a three-dimensional graph, for example. So if we put these three parameters in the right combinations, we have a hope to capture the key physical uh, features. and. For that, it's instructive to, to look at the two uh, parameters. One is what's called the diffusive capacity, which is the ratio of the transport in the tissue, in the interface, and transport in the plasma, and corresponding geometric ratio of the diffusive capacity over the, lar or the scale of the network. But another parameter, even more useful parameter, is so-called dump color number, or inverse dump color number, which literally compares the strength of advection in the network with the rate of transfer across the interface. And again, it's a mixture of the physical, like the driving flow, and biochemical, like the advection boost due to the binding to hemoglobin or the transport, uh, diffusive transport in the tissue, and the product of two geometric parameters, resistance and the diffusive capacity. So let's look first, if we don't use these parameters. If we just plot a naive total uptake using the CFD, um, fully coupled CFD, um, in, say, four representative networks, which we obtained from images, as a function of flow applied to these networks. And we can see that uh, it's log, log scale, so it varies more than order of magnitude, and it's qu you know, quite variable. Of course, for very large flows, we will reach some capacity, which is just a function of if given geometry. And for very slow flow, we are effectively in a POSEL-like regime where we are limited by the flow in the in the network. So it's approximately linear with the, with, with the flow rate. 
but the question is, can we kind of eliminate this complexity? And the, each computation is quite expensive, even though it's talk slow, it can take 10 hours uh, for each sample to run this parameter sweep. And the answer, of course, in detail, since I show it to you, using the right parameters, so we can collapse the data on a, on a, in a quite uh, nice way. So you can see that by scaling the flux with the maximum capacity and using the dump curl number rather than just the flow rate alone, we can see that this reliability is greatly reduced. And even more helpfully, you know, thinking of these ex limiting cases where everything is limited by the diffusion across the barrier or by the flow in the network, we can actually do a composite asymptotical approximation uh, which effectively reduces the full 3D CFD, coupled CFD, to just one algebraic equation, which in, in the highest uh, deviation gives less than 30% error, which for biological data is reasonably good, and it captures even it works even better for other uh, regimes. So with that in mind, we can start putting this together and think of the map of the transfer regimes, and we can think how different solutes perform with respect to their diffusive capacity or advective capacity. For example, we can think that all the gases as having the same diffusive capacity because it's easier for them to cross the barrier, but because of different binding to the hemoglobin, they will have very different advective capacity. And you can see, for example, that the carbon monoxide, which is a poison, is extremely capable of crossing up all the percent and getting over to the baby. So that's why it's so dangerous for humans and for fetuses. While, for example, the uh, nit uh, nitrous uh, oxide, which is uh, anesthesia gas, it's relatively poor in terms of being delivered, although each of them crosses at the same rate, the barrier, while oxygen sits somewhere in, in the middle. On the other hand, you can look, for example, at the solid like urea, which crosses relatively easily but because it doesn't have an advective boost, it has a low transport uh, efficiency, similar to, say, fructose, which is quite, quite hard to cross. So you have different mechanisms which lead to the same transport efficiency. So you can see that it's what important message it gives, say, physiologically, that to think about efficiency of transport, we shouldn't think one-dimensionally, just in terms of how fast is the flow or how easy it is to cross the barrier, but it's rather a generally two-dimensional uh, picture. And indeed, we need to think of a gradient if we think about changing the parameters of flow or the, or the thickness of the barrier, for example, which are both are known to be affected by pathologies of placenta. And likewise, we can add another dimension to this picture we can add metabolism because placenta is by no means passive. It needs, it's a living organ, it, it metabolizes oxygen, it eats um, glucose. So if we think of the transport in the uh, domain as not a passive transport, but a transport with a reaction, so we can re uh, update the model. And that means that you need another parameter, the effective metabolic parameter, which combines the um, consumption rate in the tissue with the diffusivity and the diffusive capacity and so on. And again, we can uh, expect that for relatively low values of consumption relative to the transfer across the barrier, these would be very much insignificant and we can ignore the metabolism. So it will be effectively just pure diffusion across the barrier. While in the case of active metabolism, we might expect quite high heterogeneity because depending on how close is the, uh, the barrier, we might or might not have enough tissue to metabolize solute in this area. And we can look at the common solutes and show that for oxygen, metabolism is relatively insignificant for the transport. But for fructose, this parameter is, is, can be large, particularly if the baseline concentration of fructose is large. So if mother drinks lots of fizzy drinks, like Coca-Cola, uh, the metabolism of placenta can become significant and you can get very high heterogeneity of, of solute of the inter, at the interface. So that was about the microscopic picture of looking at the features of the barrier of the functional exchange unit. 
And the question, can we put it back? Can we put this information in the context of the whole organ? So we already appreciate that even at this micro, micro scale, we could have appreciable heterogeneity. So what about the whole organ? And that's work in progress, so which is you know, just ongoing uh, with our collaborators in uh, Auckland. And you can see two placentas, which both result in a healthy pregnancy, but they look very different, and one with the central insertion of the cord, and another with the more peripheral uh, side insertion, and the blue is the larger vessels of the fetus. And the colors represent the different advective capacity parameter estimated for oxygen using our um, reduced model. And what you can immediately see here that for the central inserted placenta, there is a quite a uniform distribution of, so each of these balls, you can also keep in mind, it's effectively these tiny units, or even you know, an average of a few of these units, or probably 100 of these small units. So you can see the, the sheer scale of the organ. And the heterogeneity is markedly pronounced in the peripheral insertion compared to the central insertion. But what is important to bear in mind is that this picture is very much solute dependent. So we are looking here at oxygen. And if, if we think about the carbon monoxide of fructose, which are much less dependent on the flow, the both will be quite uniform. If we think of a solute which is more flow dependent, like urea or ethanol or um, anesthetic gases, both will be much more heterogeneous. So, and the final comment I make before concluding here is what it means, we often need to think not about efficiency, but about robustness. So here we can see that it's quite uniform for oxygen. And it means that if there will be a small reduction in the flow due to occlusion or other events, there still be enough capacity in placenta to deliver oxygen. While on the right hand side, even though it's healthy pregnancy, but in case something happened to one of these larger branches, the placenta might lose too much capacity to function. So what we're interested in is estimating the robustness as well as the efficiency. So because placenta has to compromise of working well enough for many solutes and for many uh, different parts of its function. So with that, I would like to conclude and say that we have an image-based framework, uh, which we now have to efficiently extract information from images and understand what does it mean for the exchange and how different solutes can be compared. And we use this and develop this for placenta, but I don't see any reason why it cannot be useful for other complex microvascular tissues like kidney or brain. And we increasingly see other groups working in cerebral flow and transport, which also uh, face similar challenges and similar issues. But what is interesting for us and, as, and, and for my medical collaborators is once we know what to look for, we now have structural determinants, not just individual parameters, but their combination. We can start asking questions of how these parameters, how these determinants are changed in pathologies by looking at pathological placentas and ask how we can change it in most efficient way to bring them back to more normal, more norm normally looking placentas. So thank you again for your attention. And if you're interested, um, there are relevant publications highlighted. And I would be very grateful to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice uh, talk. This is uh, very interesting, uh, especially applied to placenta, but it, uh, it has other applications, as you said. Uh, so I see one hand, but the name is in Russian, so I don't. <laughs> yes, Adele, it's me, it's Vitaly speaking. Yes, for some for some uh, reason for, for some reason <laughs> my name appears here in Russian. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. Igor, say, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I have yes. some questions, and I will begin with what is maybe most actual. Now you explain how different molecules uh, cross. Uh, placenta from mother to baby. But what about viruses? Well, it's a very good question. Well, viruses, they are, well, what I was talking today was mostly about really small solutes. That's why I focused on the passive or facilitated transport. Viruses, they probably cannot easily cross on their own. They require some, some cooperation from the cell. So they will require some energy uh, input. 
but by all means, uh, they are solid still, and that, that's an open question. I don't think anybody uh, has a model for virus transport across the placenta. Uh, not necessarily a model, but uh, what we know about that, because probably viruses can go from mother to fetus, right? Yes, of course. And can, in fact, infect, infect uh, baby, right? Uh, okay. It's known that Zika virus crosses very well, uh, the, so the, the South American virus crosses the placenta very well, and of major concern, and I don't think there is a conclusive uh, opinion about the COVID virus, um, but um, I think certainly viruses have capacity to to cross the placenta, but placenta also has quite a strong immune response and lots of immunity also transferred from the mother to the baby as a, as a part of pregnancy. Yeah, in fact, this is a very interesting question, uh, just immune response reduced to placenta, because as we have heard this morning, there are a lot of studies, including mathematical modeling of the immune response. I don't know whether, whether there are some works about immune response in the placenta. Indeed, it's a very interesting question. But if there are no still other questions, I will ask another one. Uh, in the beginning, you show different scales in the placenta uh, with, in this very complex structure. Is there some kind of fractal scale in there, or this is not uh, like that? Well, it's a very interesting question, a very good question. I don't think I have an answer to this in terms of definitive fract fractal model or, or the absence of thereof. I would say that because it's a real structure and has lots of lots of spatial constraints, so it's about the packing of a complex tree into the uh, into the finite volume. So this certainly will, will not be you know, too idealized uh, fractal structure, but maybe there is a range of scales, intermediate scales, where there is some self-similarity. Self Potentially. Yeah, this would be also an interesting question to study diffusion on this uh, fractal, fractal structure. I mean, well, I don't know this particularly well, but I think there are some, some works on diffusion on fractals, so maybe it is somehow related. Okay, still no... Uh, uh, I yeah. don't see other questions. I also, I, I don't know, uh, I don't have any, any special question. Well, well if, if there are no other questions, I still continue with my questions because if, if we have one minute more. Because, <laughs> okay. well, another question I was intrigued in your presentation. If, uh, you mentioned that uh, human placenta is very special, there, that there are no other uh, analogs. And for example, mice are very different from humans. Oh, we can. Okay, we can think that mice are different, but from the point of view of placenta, what is the difference between, for example, mice and humans and other animals? Well, placenta is very interestingly, extremely evolutionary divergent. So each, each species, I think, adopted their own placentas for, for the purpose of their period of gestation, number of, of fetuses they, they deliver, and so on. So, for example, mice placenta, it, uh, it has some differences in, in, in terms of how maternal vasculature is uh, delivered to placenta, the degree of, can, so it's both anatomical and physiological differences. So the, the, you can, for each aspect of placenta, you can find some analog and other models, but not for all of them. Mm -hmm. So I would say my, my, my lung of the mice is much closer to the human lung than the mice placenta. Okay, thank you very much. I don't have other questions. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so it's time to pass to the, the next speaker. Uh, yeah, we still have two minutes, but we can pass. Thank you very much again, once more. Okay, thank you. So now it's uh, Gada Abiyuns. She's ready. Where is she? Yes, hello. You are, you are there, can put your yeah. slides, please. Ah, I see you now. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's good. So we still wait one minute, just okay. in case someone else appears.
So I can start with the introduction. So um, good afternoon, Gada. So mm -hmm. you you are in uh, Lebanon. I not, don't know what time is it there, <laughs> but uh, it's fine. So it's nice to, to, to see you again. Uh, so you are working on atherosclerosis. It's uh, work related to your PhD thesis, I think, in collaboration with uh, Nader El Khatib and uh, uh, Vitali Volper. And so the uh, mathematical modeling of inflammatory processes of atherosclerosis. So we are ready and uh, you have 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Adelia, for this introduction. So first of all, I just want to take a moment to thank the organizing committee for this uh, opportunity to participate to this workshop. And as you can see, this presentation will be about a mathematical model that focuses on the inflammatory processes of atherosclerosis. Uh, let me start with a brief overview. I will start with an introduction about uh, atherosclerosis. Then I will introduce some biological processes of this uh, uh, disease. Uh, then the next section will be devoted to a mathematical model that describes the, uh, the biological processes of atherosclerosis. After that, we are going to consider a reduced model then we'll be studying the perturbed solutions as well as the traveling wave solutions. And finally, we are going to talk a little bit about the transition from the reduced to the complete system. So uh, maybe some of you will ask why you are interested in modeling atherosclerosis. Uh, and in fact, uh, according to the World Health Organization, Cardiovascular diseases such as ischemic heart disease and stroke are the top two leading cause of deaths worldwide. And even though recently COVID-19 is on track to become one of the leading causes of death, um, cardiovascular diseases remain the top leading cause of death even in highly affected countries such as China and Italy. So what is atherosclerosis? In fact, uh, it uh, is, as a terminology, it is the formation of a plaque inside the arterial wall. And uh, this causes uh, arteries to narrow, to weaken, and to be less flexible. It also reduces the amount of blood delivered to vital organs. And before moving to the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, let me uh, give you a quick glance on the physiology of a normal artery. So, so here we can see a normal a cross section of a normal artery, and this is the lumen where the blood circulates. And uh, one can notice that the arterial wall comprises three different layers: the intima, the media, and the adventitia. And moreover, we have a selective barrier here called the endothelium. In fact, it separates the lumen, where the blood circulates, from the arterial wall. Um, in fact, uh, cardiovascular risk factors such as smoking, uh, for example, uh, leads to the damage of the endothelium, the selective barrier, and this causes a leakage of macromolecules from the blood towards the first innermost layer of the uh, artery uh, called the intima. So let me explain this in more details. Here we can see the endothelial cells. Here is the lumen and this is the intima. Here we can see a, a thick matrix layer that covers the endothelial cells called the glycocalyx. In fact, cardiovascular risk factors lead to the distortion of this glycocalyx as well as to the rupture of the junctions between the endothelial cells. And this causes the particles such as low-density lipoprotein to come from the lumen towards the intima in an abnormal way. Um, and here what happens in vivo? Again, here we have the endothelium. This is the lumen, and this is the intima. As I mentioned before, damaged endothelial cells allow the passage of LDL particles towards the intima. 
but the LDL particles are considered to be dangerous. So uh, damaged endothelial cells try to attract white blood cells, cells from the blood, such as monocytes. And these monocytes undergo morphological changes to reach the intima. And at this stage, we call them macrophages. Macrophages start to release free radicals. And when those free radicals come in contact with LDL, oxidation occurs. Macrophages start to engulf oxidized LDL. They secrete cytokines to promote the recruitment of new monocytes with the affiliation of T helper cells. Now, the excess of, of lipid inside the macrophages gives it, uh, the macrophage gives it a foamy appearance. So we call them foam cells. But unfortunately, foam cells are not able to destroy completely the oxidized LDL, so they uh, undergo apoptosis. That means they die, they release their content to form an atherosclerotic plaque. So in fact, this atherosclerotic plaque modifies the geometry of the vasculature and it also changes the blood flow. Uh, studies have shown that, in fact, in atherosclerosis, there are two different processes, the pro-inflammatory process and the anti-inflammatory one. The pro-inflammatory process, in fact, it is mediated by the M1 monocytes and macrophages with the affiliation of T helper cells of subtype 1. Their role is to support the inflammation. And on the other hand, the anti-inflammatory process is mediated by M2 monocytes and macrophages and Th2. Their role is to suppress the ongoing inflammatory responses and facilitate tissue repair. Now, uh, let us move to the mathematical part. In order to uh, model uh, the, uh, the biological processes that we that we already mentioned we propose this mathematical model in fact it is a model of 14 uh, partial differential equations of reaction diffusion type where we are modeling the evolution in time of uh, different elements uh, to list them we have ldl hdl oxidized ldl monocytes macrophages t helper cells cytokines, and finally, foam cells. And as you can notice here, we have this term P. This term P represents the endothelial permeability indicator, and it appears in the equations of the elements that are going to move from uh, the lumen towards the intima. Since this, uh, this model is uh, a big model, here we have 14 equations, so it is uh, quite hard to handle such model, we propose to reduce it by keeping only the inflammatory part uh, and uh, by using some assumptions and notations, we have finally this reduced model of only five equations where we have an equation for LDL, oxidized LDL, uh, inflammatory cytokines, and uh, sorry, monocytes, macrophages, and cytokines. <clears throat> and the term P that denotes the, uh, the endothelial permeability is modeled this way. So we have first uh, this H of alpha, uh, that describes the activation or the dysfunction of the endothelium, and it is a step function. So here we have this term alpha zero. It represents a threshold to discriminate between normal and abnormal endothelial function. So uh, uh, if alpha, that refers to the assessment of endothelial dysfunction, is less than alpha zero, then H of alpha is zero. Otherwise, I mean by this when we have an endothelial dysfunction, H of alpha is one. The second term, this second term, describes the permeability of the endothelium. So here we notice that we have 
the term LOX, we mean by this the concentration of oxidized LDL, and C3, we mean by this the concentration of inflammatory cytokines. In fact, the presence of oxidized LDL and inflammatory cytokines promote the damage of the endothelium, and this is why we have these terms here. Uh, so the term P0 refers to the selective permeability of a healthy endothelium, and K1 denotes the effect of endothelial regulators. So we can, uh, we can list between the endothelial regulators, the nitric oxide, the HDL, and so on. Uh, in order to impose uh, a monotonicity uh, condition on our reduced model, um, we, uh, we take uh, two parameters, lambda 2 and P0 to B0. So this monotonicity condition will be used later on in order to prove the existence of traveling wave solutions. So here again, we have our reduced monotone system uh, and here we express the term P. Uh, now I will go very quickly. Uh, I will talk about the stability analysis of this monotone reduced model. Uh, in fact, the stability analysis leads to the presence of at most four uh, fixed points, E0, E1, EU, and E2. Now E0 lies in the negative half space. And since the unknowns of our model uh, refer to the concentration of physical quantities, so we are going to keep only uh, the fixed points that lie in the positive half space, E1, EU, and E2. We consider some conditions in order to give this classification. So if alpha is less than alpha zero, that means if there is no endothelial dysfunction, we only have one solution that is E1 and it is stable. Otherwise, as you can see here in this table, we may reach either the monostable case or the bistable case. Now let us give a biological interpretation of these fixed points. So since E1 corresponds to the to the state where we have no pro-inflammatory cytokines, so it conforms to the disease-free situation, whereas E2 corresponds to the inflammatory state. EU, it is, uh, in fact, uh, it is always unstable. It is between E1 and E2. It represents a threshold the system has to overcome in order to move from E1, the disease-free situation, till the inflammatory state denoted by E2. Now let me give you some brief conclusions uh, from this study. Uh, if uh, we have a healthy endothelium, there is no inflammation here because only E1 is stable. Otherwise, if we have a disrupted endothelium, we may either reach to the inflammatory state or to the disease-free state according to two different points. The first one is the rate of LDL penetration, and the second one is the uh, endothelial permeability. And even if we have a disrupted endothelium, but we have a high effect of endothelial permeability regulators, then the inflammation will not set up. Uh, now here we, start, we, we collected some data from the literature and we could elaborate this predictive diagram. So first of all, here we give this predictive diagram according to the values of lambda 1 that denotes the uh, LDL penetration to the intima, and K1, it denotes uh, the effect of the endothelial permeability regulators. And here we can see three different zones. So the first zone, it is a zone of no risk. Here we reach only the point E1. The second zone, it is an intermediate risk zone where we may either reach E1 or E2. And zone three, where of course we are going to reach uh, the inflammatory state or E2. 
Now, as I told you before, uh, we took two parameters to be zero in order to ensure uh, the monotonicity of this system. But the question is, what if these two parameters, lambda 2 and P0, were strictly positive, but close to zero? Do we still have such solutions or uh, close solutions the answer is yes. In fact, we uh, here we rely on the perturbation method. Let me explain this briefly. Suppose that you have this equation and uh, it has this solution here. If you vary slightly the equations, then the solution varies slightly. So we rely on the implicit function theorem to prove that if we first take P0 to be strictly positive, close to zero, but lambda 2 is always zero, then we have solutions that are close to the one found for the reduced monotone system. And we do the same by taking now lambda 2 strictly positive close to zero and P0 strictly positive close to zero. So we could prove, as a conclusion, we could prove the, uh, the existence of perturbed solutions when lambda 2 and P0 are strictly positive close to zero. Now let us move to the traveling wave solution section. One of our objectives was to uh, prove that the inflammation propagates as a wave. And this is why we are interested, interested to find a solution of a traveling wave type for our uh, reduced system. What is a traveling wave solution? Let us consider this following problem. Del u over del t equals to d del 2u over del x2 plus f of u. d is a diagonal matrix with positive diagonal elements. Uh, a traveling wave solution, in fact, it is a particular solution of this form, u of x and t equals to omega of x minus ct, where c is the speed of the wave. And of course, this wave has limits at infinity, omega plus and omega minus. So if you would like to apply this to our model, then u takes this form f of u and d. And finally, the solution omega of x minus ct takes this form. And in, in this uh, study, I mean for our model, such solution describes the propagation of the inflammation. We proved uh, the existence and uniqueness of a traveling wave solution in the bistable case for the monotone reduced model. And we could uh, prove the existence of the traveling wave solution in the monostable case, because here uh, the uniqueness does not hold. And here I can show you some numerical simulations of traveling wave solution for the reduced system. Here we start with a step function at time t0 and we exhibit the system of ODEs and we can see how the solution propagates to reach the point E2. Here we can see the propagation of the solution. It is a wave propagation. And finally, I will be talking about the transition from the reduced to the complete system. In fact, uh, when we have a particular choice of some parameters, we found, we noticed that uh, the fixed points of the complete model verify the classification uh, shown in the table that I showed you uh, earlier for the reduced model. So, in other words, there is a rigorous consistency in the study of the fixed point existence and stability between the reduced uh, model and the complete model, but for a certain range of parameters. Now, since the complete model gives a wider description of atherogenesis, we would like to, uh, to study the effect of uh, LDL penetration to the intima and the uh, endothelial permeability regulators on atherogenesis by using some bifurcation diagrams. 
And here I will explain what is the bifurcation diagram. If we look at this graphic here, if the parameter is less than the value A, then we reach the bistable case. And if it crosses the value A, we reach the monostable case. This bifurcation diagram is for the complete model. Let me explain what is going on here. So first of all, uh, the curves of the same color belong to the same plan, plane here, where lambda 1 is constant. I recall that lambda 1 uh, refers to the uh, LDL penetration, and K1 refers to the endothelial uh, permeability regulators. And we notice that if K1 is small, that means if we have a high endothelial permeability, then we are going to reach the point that denotes the inflammatory state. So the inflammation will set up. If K1 is intermediate, so we may reach either E2 or E1, so the inflammation may set up or uh, may not set up. And if K1 is large enough, we mean by this we have a low endothelial permeability, there is no inflammation. Here also, we are going to fix K1 and to vary lambda 1. And we notice here that when lambda 1 is very small, then uh, that means that we have a low LDL penetration, no inflammation is triggered. If lambda 1 is intermediate, the inflammation may or may not set up. And when lambda 1 is high, when we have a high LDL penetration, we are going to reach the inflammatory state. And these results are in fact in agreement with biological knowledge. And finally, uh, as I told you before, we in our model, we are describing two different processes, the pro-inflammatory process and the anti-inflammatory process. So in this complete model, the anti-inflammatory process is triggered by uh, the penetration of anti-inflammatory monocytes towards the intima. So uh, with this term, this is the source term for A2, the anti-inflammatory monocytes. What we are going to do is we will vary this parameter, lambda PA2, and see what happens to the behavior of the system. I will show you uh, one, only one uh, result. For instance, when this lambda PA2 is, uh, uh, when, when we increase this uh, parameter lambda PA2, we noticed that the velocity of the wave propagation using clinical data decreases. So uh, we can conclude that the attenuation of the disease severity is attributable to the anti-inflammatory process. And for instance, if we take lambda PA2 to be 20 using the clinical data, um, uh, a medium-sized uh, plaque takes uh, about 12 years to form, and this is in line with biology. Now, if we uh, continue increasing this lambda PA2, the velocity will get negative. So this behavior determines the plaque regression. So uh, as a conclusion for this section, this model emphasizes the role of anti-inflammatory effect in plaque stabilization as well as in plaque regression. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Gada. So we, we have, uh, uh, yeah, plenty of time for questions. Are there any questions? So, so I think that Vitali wants to ask a question. Okay, you you know you already know how to recognize my name, right? <laughs> so, is it is it you? <laughs> yes, it's me. That's me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gada. Yes, Gada. Thank you very much for your very nice presentation. Uh, of course, I know this work, uh, but uh, I would like you to comment on some questions 
uh, which we also, of course, discussed and which is very important about how this inflammation uh, in atherosclerosis is related to uh, blood flow. So we know that they influence in both ways. Uh, so uh, in some cases, blood flow can enhance inflammation and inflammation leads to formation of plaques which uh, changes the blood flow. So please explain very shortly, because for example, in the works of Adelia, our uh, chairperson here, this question was also started. So please, some comments on this would, I think would be appropriate. appropriate. Uh, so, so you want to explain the effect of? The no, I'd like. I, my question is: Could you please explain how inflammation and blood flow are related to each other? Okay. Um, so uh, uh, I will talk uh, about about here uh, the formation of the plaque. How it uh, how this inflammation affect the blood flow. So first of all. Uh, uh, the formation of this plaque, uh, as I told you, it changes the geometry of the arterial wall. You can see this uh, uh, this extra, uh, uh, let's say, this, uh, this plaque takes an extra size here. So, of course, um, uh, the, the space of the lumen where the blood circulates becomes uh, smaller. So, this causes... Uh, uh, how how it is shown here, you can see we don't have enough space for for the blood to circulate. So uh, first of all, the formation of the plaque reduces the space for the blood to circulate, and of course this causes collision with this plaque, and also uh, uh, at some point it causes uh, serious problems uh, such as aneurysms and strokes and so on. Now, uh, when we have this uh, um, this endothelial dysfunction, uh, the blood flow that uh, that uh, that passes here, um, uh, this causes an additional uh, passage of LDL towards the intima, and of course, this causes an additional inflammation inside the intima. Uh, uh, Vitali, uh, is this what you want that I talk about? Yes, this is one of the factors, but also there are some other factors, like, for example, flow perturbation behind the be, behind the flag with this vortices and low share rate. Uh, we know that it will increase uh, inflammation and in, uh, no, sorry, first endothelial dysfunction, and so that it will pr yes, okay. promote inflammation. Uh, yes. Uh, here we have a, a high shear stress, for example, uh, with people having uh, hypertension. High shear stress causes this damage. In fact, it uh, it, um, it ruptures the, uh, the junctions between the endothelial cells and make it uh, hard to get restored. So, uh, with persons uh, with high uh, with high uh, with hypertension, uh, we notice that we have a lot of uh, distorted and uh, damaged endothelial cells, and this is why they uh, uh, they are uh, more likely to have plaques later on with time. Um, uh, we can talk uh, also about um, uh, the situation beca becomes worse when uh, when we have nicotine in the blood and uh, uh, also nicotine works on the nitric oxide uh, it is uh, transported by the blood and this nitric sorry nicotine is transported by the blood and effect it affects the production of the nitric oxide and as i told you this nitric oxide uh, regulates this uh, endothelial uh, uh, dysfunction and we can list a lot of uh, risk factors that damage uh, this endothelial uh, uh, cells mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions? I don't see any hands. 
Yeah. So this this is this means that there is still uh, that there is a lot of work done in this field, and there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, I mean, because I have also worked on the early stage of uh, aterosclerosis, a model for early stage of uh, aterosclerosis, which is a very complex set of equations. And then we worked on a reduced model. And you, you are looking now, to, you are looking to the inflammatory process and the inf inflammatory process uh, also was studied by several authors, including Nader. And now, so concerning these two models, so you, you have this big one, uh, 14 equations, and then you, you reduce the, the model. I think it's six equations, I, I mean, I think five. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, so um, at the end, uh, you you said that uh, you showed out the, uh, the transition from the reduced to the complete. But so uh, somehow you you proved the, that uh, with the, the reduced mod. So th there is a quite uh, a kind of equivalent between the two models, or or. Uh, not exactly equivalent, but through this reduced model, you could uh, uh, reproduce the same uh, uh, results as by uh, uh, studying the full model. Is that so? Uh, studying the complete models, uh, yes, it, uh, it is close to the study of the reduced models. This is an inductive approach. We studied the reduced and now we are moving to the complete. By, by by appropriate set of parameters. Yes. And how do you get the parameters? By literature, because it's impossible to get them uh, by experiments, I guess, uh, through experimental work. Or are you uh, working with experimentalists to, to get some parameters or what? No, the parameters are found from the literature. Yeah. Yeah, the, the parameters either is by literature or then uh, through experiments in animals. And uh, when we get experiments in, in animals, so the, the parameters are not uh, uh, valuable because um, from animals we don't get exactly the, the uh, something which is really reliable for um, for humans. So. So at the moment, it's from literature. Uh, yeah. So and uh, uh, this uh, concerning your uh, your PhD work, this is the the first step, or uh, so how do are you progressing? What is the next step of uh, your work? Yes, this was the first step, and the next step is to um, uh, consider these models uh, by adding uh, a chemotaxis term, and we are studying the emergence of fatty streaks uh, when we include the chemotaxis. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, uh, the next step would be uh, the study of uh, a mathematical model with a free boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, so you are in good hands. You you know what is, exists in uh, what uh, the people is doing, and <laughs> because there is a lot of people working in the field, I think it's a, a domain of uh, big interest. And uh, and so, you gather and uh, good luck for your work. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Okay, so I think it's time to to move. I don't know if there is someone else. Who, uh, with more questions? No, probably not. So we move also to the, the next Sherman, uh, uh, I think. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So, so, thank, okay. You. thank you. So, you. I, can. I will be online, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, I continue the session and um, uh, the next speaker is uh, Euromilas Gray. Uh, please uh, share your screen. Hi. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. 
So yes, yes, you're seeing my screen now. Yeah, yeah. So please start. Oh, so hi to everyone. Uh, I'm Jiménez Garay from the University of Groningen. Uh, my talk is called Robust Parameter Estimation in Fluid Flow Models from a Light Velocity Measurement. So the presentation will be as follows. First, uh, we'll explain you briefly a type of acquisition called PC MRI or phase contrast MRI. After that, I will introduce some mathematical model for simulate a blood flow. Uh, with that model, uh, we will solve it and then we will generate some measurements as close as possible as a PC MRI we can do. And with the model and the measurements, we will define some inverse problem for parameter recovery. And uh, using a common filter approach, and with this common filter, we will perform two numerical experiments, one with normal data and the other one with allies data. I will explain what allies means in the, in the, pre, in the next slides. And at the end, some conclusions. So here we go. Uh, phase contrast MRI is a, a type of acquisition that allows you to measure the velocity of the blood flow in a specific plane. So you need to first define, as this picture is, is showing here, a lot of planes were selected through the aorta. And you can actually measure the velocity of the blood uh, in, uh, perpendicular to the plane. And one thing which is, which is important to uh, say here is that the, the scanner cannot measure directly the velocity. Instead, measure some uh, the magnetizations of the spins in this slice. And this uh, magnetization can be expressed as a complex quantity like this. And the velocity will be captured in the phase of this magnetization. I just shown here uh, the main results of the phase contrast theory. So in red is our velocity, and we measure for m, and then we reconstruct for u. Another quantity which is important here is this m0, which is the module of the magnetization. This uh, module is in this um, in this module is what we call the anatomical image of what we measure. So we actually use this anatomical image, as in this picture here now, to uh, see where our artery is or segmentate the, the image, and then we go to the phase image or the velocity image to see the values. And the last term here is this uh, phi zero term, which is assumed to only depend on the space, not over time. So what scanners normally do, they measure a second time this other magnetization, which does not depend at all on the velocity. And then they compute the phase from the from from M2 and M1, and they compute the difference between these phases. That's why it's called phase contrast or phase difference. So that's are the, the basics of the, this acquisition. So now we will try to simulate this acquisition as close as possible. So first we need a blood flow. So for that, we will consider a full aortic volume and we will just cut all in all these uh, complex branches that we have. We will, with these dashed lines are, we will just cut and we'll introduce in every outlet a reduced order modeling technique or introduce a lower dimensional model for the quantities, for the interested quantities that are involved in this outlet. So now our order will look like this. In the volume part, we will assume an incompressible flow. So we'll have navier stock equations here, the normal ones. We also are assuming here rigid walls, and we're introducing a, a Dirichlet boundary condition for the flow in this gamma inlet. And in the outlets, we will introduce this um, reduce order modeling uh, technique or model, uh, very standard for this type of models, which is called the three element being Kessel boundary condition. They can be represented as a circuit that I'm putting here some circuits because they share the same equation. This equation is for now in this case for the flow and relate the flow with the pressure in that outlet. So every, every outlet here will have three different parameters, which is the three elements of the Winkessel boundary condition. This C is called the compliance or the capacitance. And we have two resistance, the proximal resistance and the distal resistance. 
So this is our full model. We have three parameters for every outlet. And also we have the, the in blue, the parameters of, of the volume uh, model. So in total, we have 15 parameters. And we set those by looking into physiological regimes and also values in the literature. And we solve this problem at the end with a finite element, uh, finite element method. And this is how our solution looked like for a one cardio cycle. So now we have our reference solution and we want to compute some measurements uh, from that solution. So first of all, let me explain you some issue that this phase contrast MRI uh, acquisition has, which is very important actually. So we know that the phase can be measured between minus pi and pi. And when we reconstruct for the velocity, we will have something like this, which is here we have a, an expression for the phase contrast or the phase difference be between this, these two measurements. And then we multiply by this factor called the bank. This bank factor uh, has uh, velocity dimensions and it's actually very important because um, it will tell you in what interval will be your reconstructed velocity. This factor is set uh, by the operator at the beginning of the scan and need to be higher than the maximum velocity expected ex that you expect in your plane. Because um, the problem is if you have a voxel with higher velocity than the bank, then uh, this voxel will have uh, still be in this interval, meaning that the voxel will be grab in the interval, having less velocity than, the, than you expect. So this is the first issue that we have here. Now I'm showing here some real data for a uh, ascending aorta uh, slice. So we have, this is how the, the velocity image looks like for a bank 150. Uh, centimeter per second. If we go for a lower bank, let's say 100, then we have this uh, grab of the velocity or aliasing in the velocity. So you can say me, why not choose the bank very large so we avoid entirely these artifacts? So the question is, the, the answer, sorry, is, is you cannot uh, set it very large because the noise, as you are the noise of the image, will scale with the bank. Or in other words, the BNR or the velocity to noise ratio is inversely proportional to the bank. And that's why as you are multiplying by the bank, the phases, also you will, uh, you will multiply the, the noises. So the larger the bank, the larger the noise level. So if you, um, I, I'm showing here another bank, a lower bank, when you, you can see entirely all the ascending aorta allies. But if you compare the noise level, which has, are these voxels, like random voxels here to the left, we can see that they are lower. So these two artifacts uh, compete in each other. And if you want to minimize aliasing, not have aliasing, you will have very poor um, images. But if you go for very uh, high resolution velocity images, then you will have aliasing. So um, this. This feature that this measurement have, we want to simulate it now. So we will put our uh, reference solution into our numerical MRI scanner. We will choose a plane near the supraortic branches or the upper part of the aorta. And then we will interpolate our velocity to there. And then we need to move from velocity that we had to magnetization. We simulate the magnetization. We introduce into this magnetization Gaussian noise, and we will vary this bank parameter in order to have some sets with aliasing and the other ones with zero license. Because the, the main topic of this presentation is how to deal with aliased data. And we will capture all this procedure in some operator called H, our observation operator. And this is how our solution will look like now for three different banks. So in the left, we have the higher bank measurement, 115 centimeter per second. And as we're going to the right, we are lower and lowering the bank. And also we are uh, lowering the noise level of our picture. So that in mind, now we will um, 
play with this inverse problem. How up, uh, upon this uh, measurement can we get or recover some parameters of the first model? This parameter will be captured in this theta, uh, a theta vector, which will contain the parameter that we want to recover. So for that, we will introduce a common filter approach. This is a, not the classical common filter. It's, a, it's called the reduce order and sentence common filter. Several assumes are already made upon this, upon this uh, common filter. And we will reconstruct for a theta vector, which contains the parameter that we want to optimize. So we have, um, but the, the main thing is, is we are minimizing some functional, cost functional J, that this is the functional. It's a pretty standard uh, functional to minimize. We have first here our regularization term, and the other term is a data fidelity term, where the C are the measurements, this X are the state variable of the model, H is the observator, uh, the, the operator that I told you before, that create the measurements, and theta zero is the initial guess for the parameters, P zero, and W are the covariance matrices associated with the parameters and the measurement noise. So our parameter vector theta now will be for that case, for, for the experiments that I will show you here, will be the, the distal resistance of the three supraortic branches. This gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three. Uh, it can be shown that you cannot recover the, the, the four uh, resistance only using velocity measurements. So we will just make this experiment as simple as possible. So we, we will fix gamma four, and we only are recovering here for the distal resistance. So we are fixing the other two in Kessel parameters. And we are also recovering for the inlet um, amplitude u. So is this is kind of a, our simplest uh, inverse problem that we can figure out with this model. So now I will show you some numerical experiments. Um, in the top, there are the reference values that were used for the reference solution. And we, are, we will use this measurement in, and, and to see if we can recover the resistance. So for that initial guess, we have this result. Um, so th this is a, um, the, the, the evolution of the parameters over time that the, the common filter is reconstructed. So they are all start from the same point here above. And as the common filter assimilate more and more data, uh, eventually gets into the right level, which is these dashed lines are. So that, that's good because it's saying that with these uh, slides, um, only with this, it's enough to recover the, the three supraortic resistances. The question now uh, is what happened if the bank is lower than the maximum velocity? Or what happened if we use the other measurement sets with the likes on it? So if we use uh, now for the bank uh, 67 centimeter per second, um, we have ground results. And that is kind of expected because the common filter doesn't know anything about the lysing. So it's expected if you, if you give him ground data uh, is very sensitive to the data. So it, it, if you give him the ground data, it will give you ground results. So um, a lot of things have been done to, in order to, to save these images because they are commonly uh, frequent in, in, the, in the clinical world. A license may happen uh, very often. So a lot of uh, efforts are done in trying to heal in or let's say heal uh, your measurements and then or remove the artifacts and then use uh, your, your way to compute the, the measurements. But in, in this talk, we want to introduce a, a modification not in the measurement, but instead in the, the cost functional. So we will change, sorry, this is the classical uh, functional that we have. And then we, we will try to, we will change it by this in the red term. So we only are touching here the data fidelity term. And uh, this cosine function appears from uh, another uh, analysis that I'm showing you here in a, in a simple way. Uh, imagine that you have a one-box image, and you start your, your minimization 
not from the velocities, but you start from the magnetizations. So we have here, like uh, your mx is your variable, and then your, your measurement for the mx and my, the two components of the magnetizations. And we will expand the measurement in that direction by a polar form, like uh, with the with your sorry, uh, we expand this term, the, the the blue one, by the model and the phase. And now we will assume that you are looking for the the magnetization with the same module and the same reference phase or physium. If you do so, you can factorize this m zero out of the out of the functional. And then you can, using all the standard trigonometrical um, identities, you can get to this formula with this cosine. Uh, and at the end, you, you, you change your variable to the velocity. So this is for one voxel image. And then if we generalize for n voxels, uh, naturally, it will appear this sum. So that is in simple words, as simple as I can say now. Uh, why we choose this new functional. So now we will test this functional. Uh, we will adapt our common filter for minimizing that functional. And uh, we will test it with this allies measurement. So that's the results now. Um, the good thing is that we have a nice recovering for the green uh, line, but for the blue one, it's a bit underestimated. And I have tell you in the previous slide, but this area here is also the evolution of the inter interval, uh, the confidence interval. So at the end, the common filter will give you a parameter and also a, a, a confidence interval. They are both evolves over time. And with this new functional, we can move into the more and more uh, allays data and we, got, we get even better results. That's why the common filter, that probably only because the common filter is get, uh, getting benefits uh, from the, the improved uh, SNR of our image and doesn't see or, or bypass all these uh, artifacts called lazing. So uh, some conclusions. Uh, noise analyzing are, are very uh, typical artifacts involving this PCMRI acquisition. And we have shown here that uh, using a, a common filter, uh, we can bypass these aliasing artifacts and only and 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 it's actually allowing us allowing us the use of high SNR images. And I will conclude with uh, some future work that uh, we have uh, for this application, uh, of course, to include the other Bean Kessel parameters into the inverse problem. And for that, we we know that we will uh, include some pressure uh, pressure measurements into the model, and also the use the use of real data. Um, using real data has some uh, more challenges because, of course, we don't know how uh, are the reference values. So, but but of course, is is our next step. Uh, the use of PCMRI to, to reconstruct or to see if we can reconstruct a uh, reduce order model parameters as these being Kessel parameters. So thank you for, for your time and ready for questions. Uh, thank you. So questions, please. Uh, so uh, no questions, so I have uh, some questions. Uh, so uh, you assume, uh, as I understand, uh, the rigid walls of uh, 3D aorta model. So what if um, uh, they will be flexible? So how uh, can it affect your results? Yeah, let me let me go back to the model very fast. Yeah, here we're assuming like the, the aorta doesn't move at all and there is no interaction between the fluid and the structure. Um, I really don't know. <laughs> That's the, the fast <laughs> answer. Uh, I really don't know because this um, common filtering is... Um, it was originally for linear problems. It's uh, already uh, several assumptions have been made that's why it's called reduce order and send common filter. 
Um, so it's not, um, you cannot say very fast or just like that, it will work out and you can still recover. Of course, there is a more measurement that you need to add into your problem if you have FSI problem of uh, displacement and probably you will need, probably pressure measurements will be uh, necessary too. So we are not very sure. We are just starting from a simple model and see if we can uh, use a lace data. That's the, 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 the history of my presentation. But uh, it will clearly like a, a, will be our future next step, the near future. We want to move to FSI because it's uh, more realistic and it will, uh, it's a merging of more uh, works that at least uh, people in my uh, group are working on. Okay, so Yuri Vasilevsky, please. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question. So, um, uh, in our uh, MRI data, what we saw, uh, even in ascending aorta for different cross sections of the ascending aorta, we may have different flow rates, which are shown by 4D flow MRI. So it's not about aliasing, al aliasing. it's just uh, integration of certain values. Uh, this discrepancy uh, of, of the uh, flow rate in these three cross sections is not very large, like 10% or less, but still it exists. Do you know what to do with this data? The flow rate should be the same. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. You know, like uh, uh, we a couple of months ago, we worked exactly this problem using for the flow. Now we move into the PCM array because we uh, discovered that with, with one slice, we still can recover our parameter. But so I have been working with for the flow, and I know that this measurement is um, has some complications. There is a lot of uh, uh, things things that we don't really don't uh, have the access. So at the end, we are looking the, the the average of the average over time. So probably this discrepancy that you are, uh, is there, but uh, I, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is the, we, uh, with, uh, in company with Cristobal Bertolio, we work uh, last year in, in to try to correct for the flow using navier stokes models so we kind of project our solution of for the flow into the navier stokes uh, solution space and we correct it we we compute some measurements some error uh, about um so then we we kind of correct our measurements that probably i don't know if the it's a final answer but it could be uh, one possibility to fix uh, discrepancies in in flow so, could uh, you send it to me? May I, may I, may I complement that answer? Okay. Okay. So, sorry, colleagues. Uh, so we yeah. have uh, we have no time, so we have to move. And we have some references in our chat, so we can see uh, the references. Okay. So uh, we uh, have to move to the next speaker, um, Christian uh, Karsamo. Yeah, am I right? Okay. Okay, so please share your uh, desktop. I'm sorry, I am trying it. Okay, okay.
Well, if you have a problem with sharing your screen, then I suggest that you send your slides to the organizers and then we will show your slides. Okay. So please uh, do, if you can send it to one of the uh, technical moderators or to, to myself, well, to, to anybody, but do it fast, please. Okay, yes, it, it looks okay. like. Well, we see your screen, but not slides. Yes, okay, okay. there are okay. slides now, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank to the organization for the chance to to offer this talk. Uh, and also I would like to, uh, to clarify that my my last name is Carcamo, no Carcamo. So uh, this is a part. Uh, this presentation is a part of my PhD work, uh, and uh, this presentation is entitled uh, "Convergence Analysis of Pressure Recontraction Method from Discrete Velocity," who is a work uh, joined with uh, Rodolfo Araya from Chile, uh, Cristóbal Bertolio from Netherlands. David Nolte uh, from Germany and Sergio Uribe from Chile. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. The, the motivation, uh, the main motivation uh, is uh, uh, of that the study is a uh, is a uh, in the is the catheterization uh, process because uh, we know that th this is a procedure, uh, invasive procedure, so we need to avoid or we, we would like to avoid uh, this procedure, uh, uh, and for this reason, uh, the idea here is use uh, the uh, ima ima imaging or for the flow um, velocity measurement to, to estimate the pressure in the blood. So uh, uh, for, for this problem, we, we will consider the classical Navier-Stokes equation with, with data zero. Uh, and here we will consider the, 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 the field velocity is a known Field. So, for the reason we can we can um, uh, left and the pressure the pressure uh, field uh, as an unknown uh, in our equation. the The right side is uh, all the terms for the for the velocity composed by by the uh, Laplacian term and the uh, convective term. In this case, nu represent the viscosity also. And the space H will be defined uh, as follows. Uh, some relative uh, pressure metal uh, estimation uh, that we can we can find out in the literature uh, are the follow. The first one is the most popular, the most uh, uh, the, the older is the Poisson uh, pressure estimator, who consists to re, uh, to estimate the, the pressure solving a Laplacian problem. The second one is the stock estimator, uh, which consists to 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 add um, a velocity artificial velocity field, uh, so uh, converting our problem in an stock uh, stock uh, equation. And this, the third one is a uh, Darcy estimator, uh, which consists in, uh, to, in adding to um, 
a, a, a field a field a velocity with um, with velocity divergence zero uh, another in a, and another uh, another um, boundary condition. So uh, there exists another another uh, another uh, uh, scheme to estimate the pressure, but uh, we we aim to we aim to study only only this these ones the PDA PDE and SD. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, this method work uh, and in general works good for some studies but uh, in for, in our case we wanna we wanna answer um, two questions the first one is what about the convergence uh, are com convergent this method when uh, we solve we solve it uh, by using finite element method for example uh, and what happened with the cost effectivity? That, uh, that, uh, these are the, the two questions that we want to answer in, in, this, in this presentation. <clears throat> so the, uh, we want to start for the, for the PPE, uh, uh, which consists to, to to apply in the in the in the first one equation, the divergence operator, uh, which con uh, which convert our equation in a Laplace Laplacian equation for the pressure uh, with this um, and this uh, boundary condition uh, and with this restriction. Okay, for for the analyze we we will consider. Uh, the next uh, functional spaces H correspond to the H1 classical H1 uh, space. Um, B represent the H uh, H1 with uh, trace zero, um, and here we have two more two more spaces H J and Q J with J equal. U uh, one and two, and uh, for the for j equal one, h j correspond to the the function in h with Laplacian in L two. For the j equal two, uh, h j correspond to the function in h uh, with the care care in L two d. What about the Q, uh, QJ, QJ uh, correspond to the to the uh, 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 space uh, of function in H1. Uh, we satisfy the mean zero, and for the uh, J equal to corresponding to the the function in H1, we're uh, satisfying uh, this this uh, condition n dot care in L2 in the on the boundary and mean zero. Okay. Uh, here we will assume that you uh, belong to H J. Um, for for that reason we have the, 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 the next problem. Uh, find Q in QJ such that uh, that Q is solution of this equation where uh, a is defined uh, as the 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 L, L2 product uh, between gradient uh, Q and gradient R and F F uh, J U sub U correspond this this term uh, where we we have the delta the Kronecker. Uh, And so, for for j equal one, uh, we have the standard PPA, and j equal two, uh, we have the modified PPA, uh, where the difference is that here, here we have uh, the 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 viscosity viscosity term 
uh, uh, equal here. Okay, uh, for for um, for st uh, to study the convergence, uh, we we will have uh, we will use a finite element space, and so we will take um, these spaces uh, Q uh, J H and H J H uh, corresponding to a polynomial space of order K and one respectively. And also, we will consider the, um, the Lagrange interpolation with uh, their proper property, which are uh, a non property in the literature. And so, for that reason, we have a, a discrete formulation which consists to find a, a QA, QH. In this space, uh, that's uh, solve that solve uh, the equation seven, where in this case we have that the not appear not appear the the term with uh, the delta one j. What uh, or why? Uh, the the answer is that uh, the the space h j uh, h is P1, and here we have the, the a term with delta. For that reason, don't appear, uh, doesn't appear that, that term. So uh, it's possible to prove that by using like Milgram theorem, the, uh, the, the discrete problem is well posed uh, for uh, J equal one, uh, and the same situation is for J equal to, but using the generalized Latsmilgram theorem. Okay, some preliminary result uh, to to avoid, uh, sorry, to to write the 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 main result is this one, which consists in uh, an estimate and uh, a bound for. For the roar be, uh, between the convectivity um, convectivity um, term, so in this case it's possible to appreciate that uh, we can we can uh, get a term of or, of order h. Uh, the proof of the result uh, follows uh, uh, directly from uh, interpolation property. Uh, and Cauchy and Young inequality. The second one result uh, is uh, an estimation for for the uh, uh, supremum from uh, between the eighth uh, continuous and eighth discrete. Here we have considered uh, u um, u continuous, and here we have considered a, a u uh, discrete. Um, in this case, we have that it's possible to raise uh, an estimation of order h also. Here we have not h, and here we have uh, order h one half. Uh, the, the, the proof, uh, it, it's similar to the, the previous case, for, from Cauchy Schwartz in inequality, triangle inequality, in plus local trace inequality. So, uh, for that reason, we, we have uh, formulated the main result uh, where it's possible to, um, to estimate uh, a an, uh, uh, convergence result for the pressure. So in this case, we have that uh, this result is composed uh, for uh, by four uh, four term. The third term is the uh, term uh, uh, acquired by the classical interpolation property. Uh, uh, the third, the three next term is acquired by by applying the the previous. A preliminary result. So uh, it it possible to appreciate that uh, if we wanna use the classical PPA, 
uh, we don't we don't have convergence because uh, here we don't don't doesn't appear the term age. Uh, so in for for the proof uh, we wanna uh, we we can apply the the classical strength lemma uh, and 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 also the the, the preliminary lemmas. Okay. As a corollary from uh, uh, from the, the the main result is a result to um, to estimate the, the error in the, in the norm L2 uh, uh, with the difference that, uh, that here we have uh, uh, one order more for uh, for the, um, for the pressure. Then the next is the same with some variation between the between the constants. OK, now uh, we want to we want to um, want to um, analyze uh, the stock estimator. We consist to an add an artificial velocity in the left right, uh, left high, uh, left uh, side left hand side um, um, so uh, it's possible to appreciate that in the in the continuous case the, the artificial velocity uh, is equal to zero the continuous formulation now consists to to find a wq in the space B and P, uh, such that uh, R is our solution of this equation. Uh, P in this case uh, corresponds to uh, the space L02, and the formulation B and G sub U corresponds to the uh, <coughs> to the the, the sum of terms uh, that you can see in the in the equation. 12 and 13. Uh, thirdly, uh, we have we have anal uh, we had uh, we have analyzed uh, use uh, the the stock estimator using two discretization. The first one is the using uh, the the well known uh, Taylor Hood uh, spaces, where here uh, we have taken. BH uh, as the, fun the continuous function in B, uh, where where BH uh, are a polynomial function of order L with L equal to K plus one. Where appear K? K appear uh, here with the uh, function with the function. Um, for estimating the pressure, uh, and k represent the, poly and the polynomial order of for the pressure. So the the discrete problem here cons uh, consists uh, to to find uh, bh qh uh, uh, such that uh, our solution of this equation. But uh, the difference here is that we have uh, we have added. Uh, the um, the interpolation terms for for the velocity, okay, uh, and the b uh, bilinear form b is the similar to the continuous case. On the other hand, we have we have a, another discretization. We consider the the well known uh, PSPE stabilization. Uh, uh, in this case, we have taken uh, L equal K, um, and so the our problem consists uh, to find uh, WH, QH, satisfying this equation, uh, the difference with the, the formulation in, in the Taylor Hood formulation is that uh, here we have this term in in purple. So um, 
here we have uh, we have using uh, use uh, we are using a uh, 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 defined uh, for this for this relation okay uh, here also we we also uh, we, we are also considering uh, the interpolation property um, for the analyze uh, in addition we have considered considering an um, an auxiliarity uh, uh, solution uh, which is which is a discrete solution, but with the right uh, side uh, hand uh, represented by this this function. Uh, sorry, this uh, this expression with um, with the u continuous. And so uh, for both uh, Taylor Hood and Pace PG. It is possible to prove that the, the error between W and WBH tilde uh, and Q and QH tilde is bounded by by this uh, this result, which is uh, uh, kept uh, easily using some pro, uh, orthogonality pro property. Uh, triangle inequality and interpolation property. Uh, the difference here is, is only a constant for for the Taylor Hood case. We have that here appear uh, this term uh, for the uh, base PG uh, that is replaced by this this sum. So, uh, Christian, sorry, you have made probably have two minutes to finish. OK. Uh, OK, so uh, I I want to show the, the mean result to 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 advance. Uh, um, in this case, uh, we have the 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 main result is in both cases is composed by by two parts, a part of order HK, and here, uh, here uh, of order H. The similar situation is for base PG. So, uh, some some result here we have uh, we have considered consider uh, the the uh, the error uh, for the pressure in L2 norm with P U P1. Uh, and also some notation for the PPA, PPE in SD. Uh, to, to, to test um, our, our result, we have uh, taken the uh, well-known covert knife flow. Uh, in the literature, uh, it, it, it's easy. To find to find it, uh, here we have that for this result are a key for for new equal one, new equal zero one, and you can see that uh, for the base PG uh, uh, give us good result, uh, but the novelty here is that um, the PPA. Uh, including the viscous term, uh, give us a convergence. No, no is the no is the the, uh, the situation for the classical PPE where we want uh, we when when we we uh, decrease the 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 age, we don't we don't get um, convergence. Uh, the similar situation if, uh, is uh, kept if we want to take in a new, new uh, smaller. Okay, uh, the, this is our the, the 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 plot for the result uh, for uh, for new equal one new equals zero one 
uh, new equals 0.01 and uh, new 0.001 okay uh, the, the second the second uh, illustration is using uh, an experimental MRI data data um, here we have considered a phantom of the thoracic aorta with a 60% of obstruction. Uh, the, the voxel site for, for the for the flow MRI was a, a, a of is of 0 0.1 millimeter and um, 25 a time intense along the emulator cardiac cycle. Okay, these are the result for uh, for the different resolution. Um, and some conclusion uh, here is that the PP, PPA and PPA uh, with the viscous term deliver visually that uh, the same result which may occur due to the fact that viscous effects are negligible in this type of the physiological flows. Uh, some some conclusions more about um, about the PPA uh, that is the uh, this uh, this scheme is less sensitive to the to K for the finite mesh um, uh, and also the SDE base PG deliver equal or better result that, um, than the result that achieved and by using Taylor Hood space, uh, which is consistent with with the theory. So, uh, <clears throat> general conclusion: uh, the, the 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 error analysis shows that all methods uh, except uh, except the standard PPA uh, converge um, uh, in the PPA PPE discuss. Uh, we ha we have a linear order uh, convergence uh, for the experiment result. Uh, <clears throat> numerical result uh, show that uh, the where when we increase the renal number, uh, the result appeared to be less sensitive to that increment. Um, between both uh, the discretization. Uh, PSPG appeared to be equal or sometimes more uh, accurate, accurate than Taylor Hood approximation. Uh, and the final conclusion is that um, the, compu the computation with a uh, real MRI da data are aligned with this observation. Uh, uh, therefore, it appeared that SDE PSPG can be the method of choice with the uh, best accuracy and reasonable, reasonable uh, computation, computational cost. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sergey, your microphone is not on. Please put it on. Uh, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so we are out of time and we have uh, to move to the next speaker and please send your questions to the Christian uh, personally Thank you. by email. So please, um, George Aguayo, uh, share your screen. Okay, give me a second please. No, uh, you can see the presentation, right? Yeah, everything is fine. Okay, uh, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jorge Aguayo. I'm PhD student in a double degree program from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and the University of Chile. My presentation is part of my PhD thesis. In this case, this presentation is called An Inverse Method for Obstacle Identification in Navier Stokes Flow Using a Permeability Term. It's a work joined by two PhD advisors, Axel Osses from the University of Chile and Cristobal Bertoglio from the University of Groningen. <clears throat> so, yeah. First of all, 
uh, please, you can, uh, you can see this video. So the idea is using the velocity, uh, using just information from the velocity of a fluid passing through the bulbs, the idea is to recover the position of these aortic bulbs where, in these bulbs where are completely open. Well, obviously, we have some partial information. We can obtain just, for example, a information just from a, a particular region, for example, a square or just some parts of a consider a complete domain. But also, we can obtain a information in bad resolution, for example, from MRI. So the idea is, in this moment, when the valves are completely open, we can suppose <clears throat> that the steady navier stokes equations are verified. You can see also that the problem is something similar to shape optimization or topology optimization. But we, in, both in this work, <clears throat> we will do a different focus. The idea is passing from this explicit problem, when we have the domain completely defined with an inflow, outflow, and classical walls, we are supposing that this, this structure is not, is not flexible. We don't have the formations. But the idea is to, to recover this. This is the aortic bulbs. <clears throat> this is just a, a sketch of the aortic bulbs. But the idea is passing from this to this, a virtual domain. When the bulbs are not, are not drawn in the, in the domain, but we are a, we are using an auxiliary term for the navier stokes equation that represents the effects of the valve in the velocity of the fluid. The idea comes from the Brickman's law, so we can have this modified version of the navier stokes equations. In particular, this term, gamma represents here the porosity coefficient. When gamma tends to infinity, we, uh, we can see that uh, the, the domain is, is put in a complete opposition to the movement. When gamma is equal to zero, we can have the traditional navier stokes equations. So one divided gamma is the porosity of the media. Obviously, gamma is a, is a function that is uh, non-negative and distributed in all the domain. And also, we can have another unknown parameter. In this case, beta, the maximum velocity in the entry in the inflow. And now we can complement this, uh, this navier stokes equations with a condition for the outflow. In this case, we are imposing the directional do nothing condition. This is, uh, this is a modifying and an stabilized uh, version from the, uh, from the classical do nothing condition. It, and this is very useful because two reasons. First of all, in the computational sense is Stabilize the advection, the advection term of the navier stokes equation, and also is represents better the in this case the the blood passing through the aortic bulbs. So first of all, we have a problem, a real problem with the physical aortic bulbs, and we have a virtual problem or implicit problem when the valves are not in the, in the domain that we are using to, to solve the, the equations and solve this problem. So in a work with uh, Hugo Carrillo that is under review, we suppose this. You can see a rectangle. This rectangle represents a virtual domain, but also the real domain is given by this, uh, this, big, li this big lines in black. You can see First of all, the formations of the virtual domain, for example, omega 1s and omega 2s that represent obstacles. So for the omega f, the real domain, we have the, the original navier stokes equations with Dirichlet boundary conditions, just for give an, a, a naive example. And also here, we have the modified navier stokes equations. When we, when we are using a parameter, in this case, a constant error, and this identify, identify, and this function that is equal to one in the obstacles, omega s obstacles and the deformations, 
and is equal to zero in the real domain. The idea is to see what happens when r tends to infinity. And the answer is very, is very easy to suppose. Uh, UR converts to U. So in order to, uh, when we increase the value of R, we have convergence. So both solutions are very similar in some sense, in an asymptotic sense. And also in the obstacles, we have some, uh, some convergence rate. But if we can improve or impose more conditions to the boundaries, First of all, if we if we can impose C2 uh, smoothness for the boundaries and we can increase the smoothness for the uh, for the boundary conditions from H, uh, H uh, one and a half to H three and a half, we can increase the convergence rate for the obstacles and we can increase and we can obtain a convergence rate for the velocities. Uh, this it uh, uh, means that we can replace the, the effects of the obstacles and the formations for this gamma function. And also, if we if this gamma function has bigger values and bigger values, we can obtain better approximations for the velocity. The idea obviously is avoid uh, take measurements uh, from the pressure. That is not a uh, User air pressure reconstructions that uh, that Christian explained from the in the last presentation, because we only have a press, a, we only we use a measurements from the velocity, and this is part. This is a new extension for our article with my my advisors Ose and Bertoglio. You can uh, download this article from Inverse Problems. It's open source, so you can see it perfectly. The idea is to solve this minimization problem. We can have this, uh, this functional that we can minimize. The idea is to reduce the, the error in some uh, measurement region, and we can add some stabilization terms to this functional. The idea is to recover the gamma function, the permeability, that allows to obtain the, the valves, and also the, the maximum velocity in the entry. We can suppose uh, we have some profile of the velocity in the entry, for example, a parabolical entry, and the other boundary conditions. Also, we we suppose the box constraints for the for the controls, gamma and beta. Uh, obviously, uh, first of all, because we have a bank, so we can uh, obtain a maximum velocity for the flu for the for the blood passing through the valves, and also we have a maximum value of gamma. The idea is not to force to uh, optimization solver to to do a lot of work. The idea is to take so situable uh, results. We have the classical, so we have the admissible parameter functions, the traditional uh, definition, and the traditional definitions for the subvolume spaces. And obviously. With uh, some conditions, we can have existence of solution for the for the Navier-Stokes equation and also uniqueness of solution if we if the boundary condition is not so big, the classical results. And also, uh, we can say that uh, that we have a map that takes the controls and gives us the states. In this case, the velocity and the pressure. And this map is well defined. The first result. This minimization problem has at least one solution. Why we can have we can have the uniqueness of solution because so is uh, just in some in some cases we can have uniqueness of solution. Gamma must have uh, some characteristics. It's part of of this study, but in other in other sense, it's it's more it's with a different focus. But in a general sense, we only can say. We have at least one solution for this uh, for this problem, and also we can say that uh, that the map A, uh, the map A is differentiable in the Frechet sense. So you can see uh, this equation that represents the derivative of u and p with respect of uh, of gamma and beta, and also you can see that 
that the uh, uh, direction of the nothing condition has a new version for this uh, derivative way with gamma n plus gamma n minus given by this expression. And also, from here we can obtain adjoined states. The this is the classical uh, this is the classical way to to proceed during this kind of problems. We obtain the the original states. We have we we obtain the adjoined states because using the adjoined states we can obtain an expression for the first derivative. And also we can we can present the classical results for the first order optimality conditions. What means in practical in practical terms? We can use a first order solvers in order to obtain an approximation for the for the minimization problem using first order solvers. For example, descent method, descent algorithms, the classical ones. But also, we can obtain second order optimality conditions because our map is twice differentiable. And also the, the expression is more complicated. But uh, uh, the most important, the first and second order uh, uh, PVs that represents the first and second order uh, derivatives are completely linear. So we can solve we, uh, without without problems. Obviously, we have a uniqueness of solution of all that equations. All those equations, sorry. But uh, we have a lot of a lot of problems with this boundary condition. You can see it's completely weird to implement this. For example, in some uh, in some uh, software like uh, Phoenix or FreeFM, we can have some problems. Obviously, we can uh, we can have the same reasoning as before uh, to obtain the second derivatives, and also we can obtain a second order optimality conditions as before. So one important uh, conclusion about this is we can use a second order a solvers for this problem. For example, new, uh, Newton, Newton algorithm or, or quasi-Newton algorithm. For example, the FGS, a very popular, uh, a very popular solver for mi uh, minimizing problems. Minimization problems, sorry. So, we are, we are passing to the uh, to the reference test. All these tests are synthetical. So the idea is just in 2D, we suppose this. This is the virtual domain. We have in the entry a parabolical, a parabolical entry in the inflow. And suppose a velocity in the entry equal to 30 centimeters by second. We are using the, an approximation of the viscosity of the blood, in this case, 0 0.035 poise. Obviously, in the walls, we suppose a, Dirichlet, a homogeneous Dirichlet a boundary conditions. And for the outflow, we are supposing the directional do nothing condition. We are solving this, uh, the direct problem using Taylor Hood elements. P2 for the velocities, P1 for the pressures, and the limited BFGS uh, uh, solver for the optimization problem with bounded constraint, uh, with bond, uh, in a the bounded version for the controls using Dolphin adjoint and Phoenix for the uh, finite element discretization. The idea about Dolphin adjoint is <coughs> use automatical differentiation in order to solve the adjoint, uh, the adjoint problem and obtain a better uh, quick ways to calculate the derivatives of the functional. So the idea behind it is using automatic differentiation and calculate very easy, in a very easy way, the, uh, the derivatives and obviously obtain a better way to implement the BFES uh, algorithm. So, if we solve the direct problem, we obtain this, uh, the, this magnitude of the velocity in 2D, and we can interpolate this in the, in the virtual domain, so we can also use this, uh, this solution as reference. And 
and the idea is to solve the optimization problem with this functionality. So we have, we are using uh, measurements in all the domain, and we have these parameters. If you can see, in the second, uh, in the second figure here, we have gamma. When the iterations are, 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 are advancing into algorithm, we can see that the, uh, that the velocities are very similar to the reference. And also, you can see the maximum values of gamma are very near to the to the real uh, to the real bulb in this case so you can represent the maximums with this uh, with this line uh, uh, drawn in pink and you can see that sorry let me put the video again and you can see that this line is also in the same position as the original bulb so we can say that the that we have a good approximation of the maximum of this gamma function to, uh, to obtain the original shape of the bulbs. Also, we can, we can do the same using partial information. In this case, we are only using the information in this zone uh, given by this rectangle uh, drawn in pink. If we are using less information, we can have some noise, obviously, in this part here and here, but the reconstruction of the valve is very similar to the original one. And also the solver uses, uh, are using the same, uh, the same iterations, approximately 200 iterations, in order to obtain the original solution. Also, we can do uh, something similar with a uh, with a uh, measurement similar to an MRI. So the idea de behind this is obtain the reference solution. We are projecting in a Q zero space, and we can add some noise. In this case, ten percent of the noise. We are only considering the direction. Uh, we are using just the vertical direction, and we can obtain. These new results. Obviously, we are uh, we are imposing a new a new value of the weight beta. In this case, te, uh, ten at minus four, in order to decrease some noise that we are obtaining. But the results are not per are not perfect. You can see are not perfect. Also, the reconstruction line is not so good. But we can have some a uh, some change some similar to the original valve. It's not perfect because we have noise and also bad resolution, but we can solve the problem. And also the results are uh, represent something similar to the original result. Obviously, we only have, we, I only show, I only show you uh, results in 2D because we are working right now in the 3D case. Uh, finally, uh, this is just a preprint. The idea is to to write the to write to the reference to to publish the result. But also, you can see a uh, detail detail uh, detailed theoretical things and some results in 2D in this paper published in Inverse Problem at the beginning of this year, but accepted in 2010. Uh, that's me. That's my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, George. Uh, so, questions, please. Uh, so, I, I have a question. So, uh, I, I, I missed. Uh, what valve uh, do you consider? Is it a venous valve or hat valve? The idea is to recover. The idea is to work with the aortic valve. Aortic valve. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, what about the reverse flow? So uh, there might be some vorticity, some some other uh, complex effects in the flow. So uh, how it can be incorporated uh, in your model? Uh, first of all, uh, in order to analyze the vorticities, 
we are first of all we're using a stabilized a space from finite elements the idea also is in, about incorporate the, the directional denoting condition uh, help us to decrease the effects of the vorticity in the direct in the direct problem in order to obtain better why we are we have echo something similar sorry uh, okay the idea is to the idea behind it we have some uh, stabilization terms in the in the direct problem and the inverse problem in order to to improve that we have some uh, turbulences in the model that's true but <clears throat> We only are using the, the measurements from the direct problem, just from the from the velocity, and we we can see the same vorticities in the same parts of the model in the direct and in the solutions in the states from the inverse from the uh, for the optimal uh, states. So we can also recover the the vorticities in some parts of the real domain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as uh, any questions? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you uh, very much. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for a nice talk. So, this is the last uh, talk for today. So, um, we finished. Uh, yes, Sergey. And I would like to say a, a couple of words to finish our our session and to announce tomorrow uh, tomorrow's uh, presentations so yes i would like also to thank everybody uh, today's speakers and listeners i think it was a very interesting day many interesting talks and tomorrow we'll have a continuation of our workshop we'll have two plenary lectures one uh, one of them by uh, alexander chupakin about uh, modeling of aneurysm and another one by Andrei uh, Tsetorian about uh, structural biology of muscle contraction. And we'll have also two sessions, cancer modeling and cardiac modeling. So uh, I'm sure that there will be many interesting talks. And so you are welcome to listen to them. And we finish for today. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. Thank you.